Right, good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this committee the whole meeting of the Arlington Heights Village Board to order on Thursday, May 23, 2019, and I ask if you would please rise and join the Village Board in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Everybody uh, knows uh, everyone in the room, and so. But let me just, uh, for purposes of roll call, introduce the board members who are with us tonight. To your right, Trustee Greg Padovani, Trustee Jim Tenalia, Trustee Robin Lebeds, uh, Trustee Bert Rosenberg, Trustee Mary Beth Canty, Trustee Rich Baldino, and Trustee Tom Schwingbeck. I'm Village President Tom Hayes. Um, we have some new business tonight. The uh, continuing our reports from our department uh, heads and staff. And so, Mr. Recklaus, are there any introductory comments before we start? Nothing tonight, and our, our first department's gonna be the Department of Health and Human Services. Okay. James? All right. <coughs> uh, good evening. With me tonight is Nicole Espinoza, our social services coordinator, Mary Sternberg, our supervising nurse, and Karen Hansen, our village manager, or our, <laughs> our, our senior center manager. <laughs> um, our strategic report, the Health and Human Services Department, we have four divisions, and the first division is environmental health. We have three environmental health officers that conduct food service inspections, pool and daycare inspections, and they oversee our complaint and solid waste programs. Our nursing services division, we have two nurses, and they uh, do home visits to allow our residents to age in place and also provide health screening clinics and assist us with emergency preparedness. Social services, we have a social services coordinator that provides comprehensive assessments to address individual needs, and we have a disability services coordinator that is a community resource assisting with disability issues. We have a wonderful senior center in our community and it provides excellent programming services and volunteer opportunities to our senior citizens. Uh, one highlight this past year, we had 23,510 volunteer hours that came out of our senior center. We provide staff liaison support to a variety of boards, commissions, and non-for-profits. This includes the Board of Health, Environmental Commission, Citizens with Disabilities Commission, Youth and Senior Commissions, Senior Advisory Council, and two non-for-profits. Uh, Arlington Cares raises funds for our Emergency Assistance Fund, and Arlington Heights Senior Center, Inc. raises funds for our Senior Center. Workload and performance data. Environmental Health Division, uh, in July of 2018, we started the enforcement of the new food code. Uh, it required, required a lot of additional training on the part of our staff, uh, but we're still able to meet our required inspection frequency for high, medium, and low-risk food establishments. You can see on this slide that uh, our, our residents like entertainment. They like the evening and weekend events, and our temporary food inspections have increased each of the last four years. Actually, they've increased every year since 2013. Okay. Nursing services, uh, we made the difficult decision at the end of 2017 to close our community partnership immunization clinic. Uh, we had uh, significant governmental requirements from the Center for Disease Control and Infection that just required us to decide to close it. We wanted to make sure our residents that needed low-cost immunizations could still obtain them. So we uh, worked a partnership with Hoffman Estates. Schomburg is also partnering with Hoffman Estates. And our nurses go there once a month, and that allows our residents to drive the 7 to 10 miles to go to Hoffman Estates to still receive their low-cost immunizations. Social services, for the first time, uh, about a year, a little over a year ago, we were able to hire a licensed clinical social worker. That allowed us to expand our programs and services. Therapeutic interventions or something we're doing for the first time, that's in-house short-term counseling, as well as crisis interventions, which is assisting the police department, fire department on crisis situations throughout the community. Financial assistance in 2018, uh, we had financial support to 633 residents. If you look at that pie chart, you'll see the biggest portion, the biggest need uh, is for rent, about $50,000. 
Senior services, uh, we have a wonderful senior center, as I've mentioned, and in 2018, we saw between 400 and 600 visitors each day at the senior center. Key accomplishments during the 2018-19 period, I broke into three categories, expanding partnerships and collaborations, which is very important in the health field, uh, personnel updates and succession planning, and new technology. When I think of expanding collaborations, I've been with the village a long time. Interdepartmental collaborations are very important to me, and I thought we had several good ones this past year. Uh, we worked at the police department. Uh, Nicole uh, became a certified mental health first aid trainer with two police officers, and they were able to train the police department staff in mental health first aid. We also worked with the uh, police department, our nursing division, and social services division in the community addiction recovery effort. And our Board of Health worked with uh, the police department before they brought the Tobacco 21 initiative to the village board. We worked with the fire department on things. Our, our nurses have always covered the Frontier Day's first aid tent during the entire event. We needed some help, and the fire department said they'd be glad to help us, so they're helping us with coverage. They helped this past year, and they're helping again this year. Our social services coordinator also attended the morning muster meetings, uh, some of the morning muster meetings at the fire department and help them understand how she could assist them with community-based crisis intervention. We worked with the Building and Life Safety Department, several other departments, including Public Works, on a code enforcement matrix and how we could share uh, code enforcement responsibilities. And I think that's been good for the village and our residents. We also worked with the Planning and Community Development Department on a variety of initiatives. Uh, one, we obtained community <coughs> block grant funds to have automatic door openers for the restrooms at the Senior Center, which helps people with mobility issues. We were also able to obtain for the first time a bus stop at the far end of the complex so residents can be dropped off and walk to the Senior Center. <coughs> in the community, we had a lot of uh, partnerships and collaborations. We worked a lot with the Arlington Heights Memorial Library. One thing I was very proud of was the resource hour. Now, every month, uh, we go there for one hour and we just answer questions from our residents about our programs and services. We also have a wonderful counseling subsidy program uh, that we uh, help people in need that, that need counseling and can't afford it. We wanted to expand the options that we had for our residents, so we added five uh, new partnerships to our program. Senior Center always has wonderful collaborations. This last year was no different. One that I was very proud of was the Memory Cafe. Um, that's for persons living with dementia and their families. They can go to the Senior Center and they meet with other uh, people with dementia and their families. And that was a collaboration between Age Options, Catholic Charities, the Library, Park District, and us. Uh, we have a lot of good municipal and governmental partnerships to maintain best practices. Uh, one example was David Robb, our Disability Service Coordinator, is the chair of the Northwest or the uh, Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus ADA Coordinators Group. Personnel updates and succession planning. As I mentioned, uh, we were pleased to be able to hire a licensed clinical social worker for the first time that expanded our programs and services. One example is if, if you have an LCSW on staff, you can have a Master's of Social Work internship program. And we've had students, two students now, you can have them for the entire school year. It's at no cost to the village. They learn about our programs and services and we get extra manpower. Our administrative assistant, uh, my administrative assistant retired this past year. She did a great job for me. And we were able to replace her with Melissa. She comes to us with 10 years of experience as a manager at a local hospital. That helps us on the clinical side. Uh, we decided, we made the difficult decision to make our full-time nurse, public health nurse. We switched it to a part-time community health nurse. Uh, with some of these changes in nursing, we're able to add on 19 hours of on-call senior center staff help each week, which is much needed. It's a very busy center. Our boards and commissions had a lot of great programs in the last year. Uh, one that I'm just using as an example is the Let It Snow, Make It Go program. That program, we actually had three commissions work together, uh, the Youth Commission, <coughs> Senior Commission, and commission with, or commission with Disabilities, and that links our youth, our teens, that, uh, with our seniors and people with disabilities that get their snow shoveled. Not to be outdone, our not-for-profits also did a great job this past year. Arlington Cares was named the 2018 Non-for-Profit Organization of the Year by the Arlington Heights Chamber of Commerce. New technology, uh, in July of 2018, 
When we went to the new food code, uh, we also decided to go to a new digital platform for inspections. No longer are we handwriting our inspection reports. Now everything is digital. With that, we can attach pictures to the inspection reports of the violations that we see in establishments. For example, that first picture you're looking at has six violations in it. That second picture has four violations in it. And if the property or business owner happens not to be there when we're doing the inspection, pictures are worth a thousand words, they can see what the violations were. Uh, also, our property maintenance inspections, when we do them in the field, now all of that's digital. And when we do those, everything comes to our desk in real time. So if they're out on a property and they're entering their findings, as you see on the right side on one, I can see that uh, sitting at my computer desk in real time. And I can share that information with you. Also, they attach pictures. I see those pictures in real time. So I could sit at my desk and I could tell you what I'm seeing uh, at a violation at any given property. Senior Center also has new technology. We got a digital gate counter that puts information up to the cloud now. So it gives us hour by hour uh, how many people walk in the front door of the Senior Center. So if we have an hour, like say on that first top line there, it's 84 people and at 12 o'clock, uh, we can see if programming is making a difference or what's causing people to come in the door at certain hours of the day. It helps us with programming feedback, staffing, and it provides a baseline to help identify potential need for change. Review of current and anticipated changes. I think you all know that recycling has been an issue nationwide over the past year. Uh, we've been working with the Solid Waste Agency in Northern Cook County, the Environmental Commission that's actually had a display that they've rotated around the community and Groot Industries on giving information out on exactly what you can recycle and what you can't recycle. Uh, the slogan's changed now to if in doubt, throw it out. If you don't know that it can be recycled, don't put it in the bin. On the right side of that slide, you'll see we're in the fourth year of a five-year single-family solid waste contract with Groot. One thing in the near future that you'll be talking about or looking at is do we want to retain twice a week collection as an option? Currently, uh, this is week old data. We have 18,414 households on the program. 8.2% is using the twice a week collection, which is only 1,506 households. Uh, recently, the Illinois Department of Public Health came out with a study and it said that there's a significant unmet need for mental health services. Four age brackets in Illinois, mood disorders was number one reason for hospitalization. And uh, just over a month ago, I gave you the social services community needs assessment, and we're working on trying to make a difference in our community. Senior Center is 21 years old now and uh, due for an update. We had all the uh, tenant agencies there put together a wish list of what they think could make the Senior Center even better. And uh, we're looking forward in the near future. This, that wish list was given to the planning department. So we're looking forward in the future here to be able to update the Senior Center. New initiatives and potential initiatives explore in the future. We want the Senior Center to be nationally accredited. We had a kickoff orientation committee meeting on May 2nd and uh, we're looking forward to the process. There's 10 uh, committees that have to work on this process. And we're hoping, that looks like a candy land up there to me, but <laughs> we're hoping that by March of 2020, uh, we'll be nationally accredited. Also, our senior commission is working on the ARP network of age-friendly community initiatives. That's about a five-year process. It looks at the eight domains of livability for seniors in your community. You can see on the right side the eight different areas uh, that it incorporates. And we were able to obtain a Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning Technical Assistance grant to help with this. Uh, that was done through Noah Boyer and the planning department and much appreciated. And we're looking forward to moving forward with this endeavor. We had a benefactor that's given us a significant amount of funds and uh, the only request is for afternoon programming. We have a lot of great programming in the afternoon at the Senior Center, always have, but now we have more money to spend and we're looking forward to adding some uh, new events in the upcoming year. 
Uh, the Senior Center is also exploring opportunities to provide conveniences that customers today are becoming to expect. Uh, one is online registration from remote locations. Uh, this aligns with the proposed ERP transition uh, that would allow residents to be at home and register for classes. Uh, also the same type of thing, a lobby registration kiosk where instead of having to go up to the counter and tie up time by our staff to register for a class, uh, they could just go up to a kiosk in the, in the area and, and sign up. And the potential for accepting charge cards, something we currently don't offer uh, for programs and services. Uh, we're going to continue to look at solid waste and recycling opportunities for the village. Uh, one example is household hazardous waste collection. Uh, we haven't had one in this community in several years, and things of that nature we're going to explore. And then we're continuing to look at ways to expand and promote our programs. Uh, one thing I don't like to hear from residents is I didn't know those services were available. Uh, so we're looking at ways to continue to promote our services. One example is in our nursing programs, we just started using the 2019 Health Awareness Calendar. So we're picking a topic uh, for each month that uh, is a health topic. And then we're doing something, either education piece with it, or here's an example for this month, uh, it's National Diabetes Awareness Month. So doing our blood sugar screenings for a dollar just for the month of May instead of the normal cost of $3. Uh, with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. <clears throat> well, thanks, James. Great report. <coughs> thank you. Uh, you guys are certainly involved in many, many different things, and we thank you for all of your efforts. The um, only question I had was regarding uh, mental health services. And um, I see Nicole there. Welcome back, Nicole. And um, I just maybe you could answer this question if you want to come forward. Just regarding the um, counseling services that you are actually providing where people actually come into the community. Can you talk about that, sure, what your experience has been? So I like to refer to it as kind of ad hoc therapy. Um, we have residents who are kind of trying to transition into counseling within the community, but maybe they're on a wait list or maybe there's just a barrier to getting them to that care. So we're providing that short-term therapeutic intervention to try to get them to the right level of care. Right, and then you're actually providing the, the counseling services yourself or are you then directing them to someone else outside the village? So, so we're providing them temporarily in order to get them to um, someone that can see them long term. So for example, if somebody um, is maybe nervous about engaging in therapy or going to an agency, perhaps I'm helping them with one or two sessions to get them comfortable with the idea, connecting them with that agency, and then they're able to make the transition to have that long term therapy there. Okay. And how many people have you seen in that capacity over the past year or so? Get back to it. There's I'm just, just a, a it's estimate. A ballpark. Um, I would say at least 50. Yeah. And are you seeing an increased uh, number of people? The trend is going up? I, I would say yes. Since we've done so much interdepartmental collaboration with police and fire, we're able to identify more individuals that need these services. Um, also by doing a holistic assessment, meaning when someone comes in for rent assistance perhaps, we're not just looking at the rent assistance need, we're looking at all of the presenting challenges. So oftentimes what we find is somebody comes in wanting rent but really needs counseling subsidy as well or needs that emergency assistance. Um, and so we're able to identify those cases and connect them with the right resources at that time. Okay, thanks. All right, questions from the board? Trustee Rosenberg. Thank you. Thanks, James. Yep. Uh, just curious what the experience with uh, opioid use has been uh, have you seen increase decrease I know I think uh, I've seen some statistics that show that it's gone down actually last year what's your Nicole you've been doing the most work on that Nicole you might want to go then other oh, yeah that, I don't know if that <coughs> might work yeah. just so yeah. we can pick it up on TV sure um, so we've we've seen steadily steadily the same numbers in terms of, of death rates and overdose rates over the last few years, um, pretty consistent. Um, what's different now is that we have the care program, so our police and fire are actively trying to engage individuals who um, have had an overdose in a program that connects them 
to counseling um, and also what's called a care coordinator. That's an individual that can help them walk through every step of the recovery process to make sure they don't fall through the cracks as well. Um, so that's what we've been trying to, to do. And so is that an outside agency that we refer to or the care so, coordinator? Mm -hmm. So we have, it's actually a collaborative, um, which we have the health department, fire department, police. Um, we have several agencies, Live for Lolly. We also have Omni, um, Northwest Community Hospital is a partner on that project, and Brightside Clinic, which does um, medically assisted treatment. We're all collaborating together. Um, and the care coordination piece is done by Omni and Live for Lolly. Great, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Um, James, what is the distinction between what you refer to as low, medium, and high-risk restaurants? Can you kind of describe that for us? Yes, high-risk ins inspections are three times a year, and that means that they're actually doing a lot of preparation of the food. So that puts them up to a Category 3 inspection. A medium risk would be like your McDonald's, your typical fast food. And then low-risk inspections would be like your convenient marts. So that's how it's separated out. Okay. Thank the, you. With the new state food code, the high-risk establishments, there's a lot of requirements now, a lot of new requirements. We went from a state food code that was 130 pages to now it's 800 pages. And it's just a lot of different training that they have to provide those high-risk establishments, so it takes them longer when they're in the facilities. And how are the restaurants, especially the high-risk ones, uh, meeting the expectations or the code? Yeah, I think they've been doing good. They, we've been training. If We've put out information for the past two years. We've been training them and giving them information and talking them through what to expect coming up. So I think all three health officers are pretty pleased with where we're at right now. Great. Um, just curious what the, with the new Cook County Health Clinic opening in the north of Arlington, does that have any bearing upon the health services or nursing services or anything? No, the services, the dental programs and the services up there really doesn't have a bearing on what we do. Okay. Um, so is it something that... The you attended that? Mary, yeah. Maybe you can answer that. Do they offer any services that that we're doing that they pick up now from residents? Or? You, you have to be a patient of theirs. So if you're going to go to that clinic, you need to agree to be one of their their patients. Otherwise, so they're very similar to a doctor's office. So okay. different than what we do. But is it, is it based upon more of a economic need is from the standpoint? They or? will take more of the lower paying insurances. They're still working on many of them. They do take Medicaid, but there's various different providers. So they still don't take all of them, but most of them. So okay. they can serve that. Thank you. Uh, just a question about recycling. So based upon your numbers, have we seen an increase, decrease as far as res A, residential, B, commercial uh, recycling as far as in the village? Or? Residentials increased from 2017 to 2018. Solid waste has decreased. I don't know about the commercial. So I know that there's continually, we get complaints from the commercial side as far as the businesses or commercial buildings having to pay extra because of contamination and things like that. Or What's, what yeah. are we doing as far as to help through that? That's the multifamily side, and it's uh, there's a couple haulers that they're charging them now if there's a contaminated load. So if they have to come back because the containers are contaminated, they're charging per time they come back. Um, we've told them if it's a continual problem and they feel like that the, there's no answer for them to, to let us know to give us something in writing that specifies what the problems are, and we'll evaluate it. Uh, to date, we haven't had to uh, say that we're no longer gonna enforce multifamily recycling. Uh, if I did, I'd have to come before the board and ask, uh, discuss that with you. But the, the last one we said, provide us with a letter explaining all your concerns, and we haven't received the letter yet. So as far as the commercial side, are the haulers providing recycling services to the restaurants and places like that? Or? It's an optional service. It's not required. Multifamily, it's required. Do, based upon your numbers, do you see most of them using it or not using it? Uh, you mean in the commercial side? Yeah. Some of the facilities are doing it, if, but a lot of them aren't. <clears throat> and now 
with everything that's gone on in China and then just recently with India and the plastics side, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, there, there's a lot more of the products that are losing money. So the, the recycling on the commercial side is being more difficult. So it's no longer a case where if the commercial business recycled, they would be a economic benefit. It's basically they still have to pay for it. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it really depends on whether or not they can recycle a load cheaper than they can take it to the landfill. And the commercial side's the ones that are going to have the most likelihood of not participating because multifamilies and, and single family is not an option. It's always provided. And last question, how is uh, Swank handling the, the need for space for uh, waste as far as being able to I know that for a while there, a number of years ago, there was a cry for that there was no more space available for waste. Yeah, I haven't heard that as being a problem right now. Okay. Thank you to you mm -hmm. and everyone in your department for all you guys do. So. Thank you. Anybody else? Trustee Baldino. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, James, for your presentation. And, and like Bert said, everything that you and your department does. Uh, basically, I have two questions. Um, the first one is on the rent assistance. Um, I, I was looking through the report trying to see if there was a little bit more detail about what that looks like. And what I mean by that is that, does that usually entail a one-time assistance? Is it short-time assistance or is it a more longer-term rent assistance? We're a stopgap measure and our intent is to help them one time. We help them one time in 18 months. So if someone comes in and receives help from us, then we don't help them again for 18 months, typically, unless there's a unique situation. Okay. Um, we like to say in some cases we help prevent homelessness in the community. Uh, some of these people and some of these rental units in town that are just making it, just getting by, uh, we can help them fill that gap. Uh, sometimes you have, all it takes is they're really tight and then they, they lose a job, but they're in the process of getting another job. Uh, Nicole could probably answer this a little more detail than I am, but that's that's the type of things we're seeing, and uh, uh, we see a lot of people coming in the in the doors and from certain areas of town that really need the help. Right. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that that a uh, little bit more detail. Um, my second question had to do with recycling, and Bert stole some of my thunder, <laughs> but that's <laughs> as long as the question got answered. Um, but when I was reading through the report. Um, the report says that we have recycling locations at the Senior Center, Public Works, and Village Hall. Um, but it only talked about um, recyclable materials um, for plastic bags at those three locations. Correct. And I know that there are other items that are recycled, like uh, fluorescent lights and rechargeable batteries now. Do those three locations accept all of those items or just plastic bags and then the other items are only at Village Hall? Yeah, the plastic bags was an initiative by the Environmental Commission mm -hmm. through yeah. Trek, and they were able to get containers for more than one location and we thought those were the best three locations right. to give residents options. That's why the plastic bags are at all three. The other swank items like mercury thermometers, uh, right. I think light bulbs, do you guys do light bulbs too? Okay. Just us. Yeah, so all of those other items, the mercury thermometers, uh, the light bulbs, we do do like crisp or holiday lights. Holiday lights. Those are done both at the public works facility and ours, but the rest of them are just through the health department. Okay. Except Sharps. Sharps is done at the senior center. Oh, they are. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and that's done here at Village Hall as well, Sharps? Sharps are just done at the senior center. Just at the senior center. Yeah. Okay. And then the... Uh, the other disposable items, medicines and so forth, now we have the 24-hour location at the police department. Okay. That used to be done at the senior center, uh, the medications, but now we have the mailbox in the front lobby of the police station. And what is the participation in that, in those recycling locations um, looking like? Is it, is it getting better? Is it, is it still kind of slow? Is it, are those... Those programs that we have in the health department are very busy. And we're, <laughs> that plastic bag container, for example, in the hallway, we're emptying that, it seems like, every day. I mean, it's amazing how many residents want to recycle those items. Uh, the batteries was a huge uh, 
popularity. We hated to have to stop that. That was a change with Swank, but we still collect the recycle, recycle batteries, uh, the green batteries, and uh, those are coming in all the time. People bring the light bulbs in all the time. All those programs are very popular, and I think Karen attests to the medications and the sharps at the senior center. Those programs are very popular. Uh, at least two or three a day coming in. Yeah. Great. That's that's great to hear. I'm I'm really glad to hear that. Thank you, Mayor. That's all I've got. Trustee Canty. Just really quickly back to recycling. Mm -hmm. So I, I read in the report and I've I've seen other areas talking about how challenging it is to recycle. So I guess my question is, how are we gonna try and get ahead of that? for Arlington Heights? Have we considered programs to try and help people understand how to reduce waste, generally speaking, or thinking of programs like um, Philadelphia does a recycling for points kind of program um, where you can actually earn discounts to local establishments for, the, for creating less waste and recycling in, okay. in general? What we have done, we work with the Solid Waste Agency in Northern Cook County really closely. And right now, uh, what they've had is the haulers in the region have all been getting together and the other players in the recycling industry. And they've been trying to come up with material that we can share, which that one slide showed you that information that we've had on our village website. We also had a video on the village website that they all feel comfortable saying this is what we can recycle. And I spoke to Groot a week ago, and right now they're putting together, they're going to have on their website, and we can have a link to it. They're going to interactive things, so you can type in, can I recycle this, and it'll answer your question. And that's what Groot's working on right now. And then we had the Environmental Commission. They made a display of what you can and can't recycle. We had it at the library. We had it at the train station. We had it here at Village Hall for a while, rotating display. So we're doing things like that. Um, when I talk to Groot, we don't want to put, the, the easier thing to do would be able to, purchase a bunch of stickers that say this is what you can and can't recycle and put it on every cart. But the problem with that is, is if things continue to get worse and then we have to drop an item like say glass is no longer recyclable, then we've got these stickers on all the carts. So we're trying to make it more interactive and have information available that we can change if we need to uh, and get people to really understand don't take your hoses, your, you know, your water hose and put it in a recycling bin. You know, we just, it's got to be clean. It's got to be uh, good quality material now with all the changes that's gone on overseas. So uh, that's how we're trying to promote it. If, if, I, if I could, Trustee Canty, um, I sit on the, the, I'm the alternate for the Swank Board, and we talk about these issues a lot. Um, and it is a challenge, not just here, but across the country. Um, and I think there's a couple of things going on. Um, education is definitely going to be part of it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we've talked about is putting out videos that kind of show people what can and can't go in. That's something that can be changed if the circumstances change. Um, but some of this is going to be on the garbage haulers. You may see changes um, where they may charge a different business model over time as well. Um, because they collect data on how much garbage they collect. Um, they, you know, having barcode scanners and things like that on trucks is not that far-fetched these days. And so it may be in another contract or so, you may have the waste haulers addressing this in a different way just for economic reasons because they can't take it. And so um, they, so there's a lot of things, but it's very much a moving target. Um, we're something that we're following. Um, the other thing in terms of, that you're seeing in terms of the address, uh, Trustee Rosenberg's comment about landfills, there's right now a pretty big push where larger uh, waste haulers are purchasing smaller waste haulers. And, you know, we've seen, we saw that it's even with, with Groot. And what they're trying to do is get, they call it vertically integrated, where they have a really good network of waste transfer station landfills and so it's a very they try to make it as efficient as possible so i think that's going to continue um so far that hasn't really impact we haven't seen an impact in our service but you know over time depending on which companies are buying what i mean that could impact the industry too so it's very much an industry in flux and um there, there aren't any easy answers right now but we're, we're definitely kind of in the conversation would would we ever consider um, doing something where we try and cut down on the waste in general, right? Like in some areas they ban plastic bags or, or things like that, right? Is that something that we should be 
looking at as an option to try and cut down on the waste that is generated at the outset? Well, right now the Environmental Commission has been looking at bags, and I, I believe one of their items they're going to bring to the village board is recommending that you support the uh, bag charge that they're, the state is looking at, where they're going to charge a fee for bags if you use them in the, and I guess it's both plastic and paper bags. They're going to add a fee if you go to the grocery store and you want to take a bag, you got to pay this extra fee. And I know the that's the one thing that the Environmental Commission is in support of, and I think they're going to be bringing that forth to you. To you to consider it actually was going to go in the manager's digest this friday oh. um they <laughs> Sorry to steal your no 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 and, and <laughs> the, to, to dovetail on that one of the things that they've talked about is so different waste agencies in our case it would be swank um they would benefit from that revenue from the bag tax and then that can be used for additional education so um that could present some opportunities for us in our partner communities as well Trustee Schwinger back. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to go back to that same chart that Trustee Rosenberg was talking about with the high, medium, and low, uh, from a uh, manpower perspective, it appears that the complaints received have stayed fairly stable over the last three years, mm -hmm. but the, the inspections have dropped a couple of hundred uh, from 2016 to 18. What is the main driving force for that? Are we talking about the the complaint inspections versus the complaints received? So the complaints received on that food inspection chart, those have been a little over 400 a year. So on that chart there, you're showing the high, medium, and risk, a low risk. Okay. But then we had another chart in our packet that showed the number of complaints received have been always a little over 400. Okay, so you're talking about property maintenance complaints, probably not food complaints, because it probably would have been on the uh, same. It's on the same. Let me go. I got slides. Environmental I don't think Health handles both of those types uh, of them. Environmental Health Division handles both the right. one here. food inspections and the yeah. property maintenance yeah, complaints. Yeah, that's it right there. Yeah, that's complaints. That's property maintenance complaints. So we receive, uh, like in 2018, it looks like we received over 400 inspections. The second column, is, or uh, complaints received, complaint inspections. So we received over 400 complaints, and then that's how many re-inspections it took to get compliance. Okay, so this so chart sometimes we is have not to go back to a property. No, this property. is a regular property maintenance. Okay. We may have to go back to certain properties three or four times before we get them to get compliance. Sometimes we have to take them to adjudication court to get them uh, to get compliance. Okay. So that just varies depending on uh, the type of complaints we're receiving. Okay. This time of year, for example, as you can see with the nice weather and all the rain, we've been getting a large number of grass complaints. And now we're going into a nice holiday weekend. Uh, you know, people like to see their grass cut, so those are the type okay. of things. So sometimes we have, may have to go back a few times to make sure that the problem is resolved. And then my other question, I went back to some of the paperwork that we got when we took our orientation with your department, and I, I couldn't find this. But, you know, one of the things that I hear coming from people um, uh, and the things that you have out at the senior center are phenomenal. Um, you know, people always talk about tax preparation, but the big one always seems to be, um, and I couldn't find it in there, help with setting up Medicare. Are, are those services, do you provide those out at the uh, Senior Center? Karen, I think you'd be best to answer that question. Because that seems to be something that really concerns people and, and they're lost in that whole process. We do actually have two parallel programs, Senior Health Insurance Program, one operated by the Village um, and one operated by Catholic Charities. Uh, I think we see a six, six to eight hundred in our own. I can't speak for the Catholic Charities one. The two programs are nearly identical. It's just that they grew up at the same time and we would have either had to have given, one of us would have had to have given it over. So um, we kept the two programs in place. They are, the counselors are trained by the state of Illinois Department 
of aging. Um, the program was born in the state of Illinois' Department of Insurance, and um, it became a Department of Aging program more than eight or ten years ago. Um, and um, both programs are pretty re robust. Northwest Community Healthcare also does some senior health insurance program counseling at the senior center. So, you know, if it's if it's a Medicare question, they probably need to check at the front desk and, and make sure that they, you know, that they're understanding it. Um, we do send people to Catholic charities for the same program, senior health insurance. If we have any inkling that there are more and other underlying issues with a you know, person, if for example, um, yes, they have a, a need for Medicare counseling and supplemental or um, uh, you know, from Medicare B, or they look, need to look at the Advantage plan, which is Medicare C, um, from that, um, we do send them to Catholic charities if we know that perhaps they're also having some trouble um, making their rent um, or uh, dealing with an, um, an adult child with problems or um, so just in general some depression or things like that, we send them in that direction where they'll get both services at the one time. Okay. I was thinking more of giving folks uh, help figuring out Medicare figuring out what parts they need and the benefit level. That is a one-on-one. -on -one. They actually, you know, hands-on, go online with them to the www.medicare.gov okay. site. And actually, at the end of it, the person knows exactly what is the best insurance products to, to pick out, um, and they can explain it to them. So I, I don't know, you know, if you've gotten a lot of complaints I'll need a little bit more feedback to try and see how we can address them. All right, thank you. We've also done Medicare presentations as well to do the larger piece education. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Trustee Labaz. Thank you. Uh, James, thank you for uh, all you do in your department, and thank you to your staff both here and not here for everything that you do. It's really important. And it, it kind of dovetails to a question that came up in my mind, and that is really before I sat here, I wouldn't have really wouldn't really have occurred to me to call the village for the variety of help that you provide. And although it you know it, it it's obvious that you see a lot of people, is are there a lot of people like I once was who don't know that they can reach out to the village if they need help? Is there more publicity or something like that, or or do you feel like most people seem to somehow have a handle on this I'm never satisfied with how much promotion we're putting out we, we put out quite a bit of promotion yeah. but that's one of my goals you'll see it in in the budget book this year one of our goals is to increase promotion because uh, we still have residents that come up and say you know I didn't know you had those services and that really bothers me because I think we have wonderful services that we offer the community in Arlington Heights uh, really great you know opportunities for residents to, to get help and get the needs uh, that we provide our nursing programs our social services programs senior center um, so yeah I'm, I'm never going to be satisfied with that I think we have to constantly look at ways now with social media and all the different ways of the different platforms that we can get our information out we have to look at opportunities to do that even the TV access channel you know we had a nursing program we had a senior service one where we could boot those back up and remind people watching the access channel that you know we have these programs and services but that's always a challenge uh, to make sure everybody's aware of what we have especially now with the changes we're making in social services we want to make sure people know that we have new uh, new opportunities for them to obtain services sure and and that's great and I know that I for one have on some occasions either told people who mentioned things to me that they needed help with something I said well you should call the village you should call the senior center they can help you through this or if even a couple times made calls myself and you all have been very helpful with that so thank you but yeah I'll be interested in you know continual promotion for yes. this lot mm -hmm. we have a big community I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go I ahead. I can tell you, you have a comment. I, I was just going to say just for the benefit of anyone um, you know uh, watching this at home the assistance programs, we talk about rent and we talk about a lot of the programs that we administer, that's not done with taxpayers' dollars. I just want to make that point. 
that that's Arlington Cares is a non for profit, and they receive donations. Um, and we what what is the annual budget for Arlington for the general assistance program that we give? Well, Arlington Cares, for example, gave us a check this past year for twenty thousand dollars. Right, and, and so and uh, we have a significant sum of money that we have in that in that fund now because of Arlington Cares and other people throughout the community that donate funds to the Emergency Assistance Fund. We have a lot of people that donate to that line item. And then the village also provides $40,000 for the social service programs. Right, right. But I, I want to make that point that this is really a really best of both worlds hybrid program where we're getting kind of the benefit of local government oversight with, you know, the use of private donated funds that kind of help the folks in need in our community. And so it, I just want to highlight that point. Mm -hmm. And I'll put in a plug that Arlington Cares has some fun fundraisers. So I do. Yeah, and J I, James and I have seen each other at <laughs> concerts at the Metropolis on that were there to raise funds for Arlington Cares. <clears throat> so And there usually seem to be some seats available, hint Yes, yes. So <laughs> Please come out. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, uh, another question that you kind of, different subject, but a question you, or something you kind of touched on. As I was reading through the report, it, it was apparent that there's some overlap with, you know, the inspections that you do and then types of inspections, or at least it seems to me that building and uh, life safety does. So, but it sounds like you all are working together to uh, make it more collaborative. Yeah, I was very pleased with the code enforcement matrix we put together, public works and building and us, we all do code enforcement. Yeah. And we looked at how we could better use the manpower in all three departments. Uh, for example, now a lot of the property maintenance type inspections, the health officers do, that takes some load off of building inspectors. And when they're in peak time, like right now, they're trying to get you know houses inspected and all the different things that they do in building. Uh, if we can share that load a little bit better with the existing manpower we have right now, uh, it helps everybody. It's a win-win. And it helps the residents because things are getting done quicker. Okay, thank you. And I have one last question. It's a, it's a recycling question, but it's a program question. Towards one of your last slides, um, you had a uh, the solid waste recycling opportunities slide, and it mentioned the household textile collection. And, and it was too small for me to read, but so can you explain what that might be? Because I hadn't heard of that. Yeah, there's a uh, company, I met with them just about three weeks ago, uh, that now provides textile collection door-to-door, -door, where you can put a bag out at your house and they'll come and pick up your textiles. And uh, I asked them to provide me with additional information for us to consider that. Uh, I don't want to uh, have an impact on our brick and mortar operations in town, the resale shops. Right. Uh, they say it wouldn't impact them and that they actually assist them in certain areas. So if it's something when they give me the information that I've asked for, uh, I think is something we should be considering. I'll be working on that with the village manager and then we'd bring it before you for discussion. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Trustee Tanalia. Uh, just a couple of quick things, James. You know what a great presentation you, you have hit on so many fantastic programs that I bet you know a lot of people don't know exist, and the things you guys do are pretty awesome. So congratulations and thanks for Thank doing you. everything that you guys do. Uh, so um, people over here that do it well. Well, and you do clearly. You do. Um, the the couple of comments I had are, are kind of brief. When it comes to lawn and garden maintenance and buildings and garages and things like that that we can drive around town here I mean, and as a wonderful place of Arlingtonites is you'll see occasionally problems mm -hmm. that are uncared for untaken care of you know in a lot of different ways what's our policy on that with lawn or landscape or garages that have the siding falling off and things like that yeah so we have uh, we get complaints on a regular basis every week we get complaints and this is a busy time of year for example like I mentioned with grass and weeds mm -hmm. uh, they make the complaint and then we'll go out and do an inspection uh, if it's a vacant property we have to post the property so we have to give notice for seven days and then after that if it's a vacant lot we'll have our village contractor cut the grass if they won't cut the grass that's how we maintain and keep it looking nice in the community uh, with the contractor 
if it's private property, we go to them, we work with them. Our health officers try to educate them. It's always about education. How can we help you as a resident understand the need to repair this or maintain this? Uh, and we try to gain voluntary compliance with them. Uh, if not, then we have to go into enforcement action, and that's what our adjudication system's for. Um, but we deal with a lot of different property maintenance issues, and we want to keep our community looking nice, and we also want to make sure the residents understand, you know, what the reason is for why we're coming out to their property. I, I imagine there are a, a handful of reasons for that to happen. Could be someone who is unable to take care of it or do it right, uh, needs help. Could be someone that doesn't live there anymore, for a pro property for sale, could be vacant, whatever. I, I think there are other communities out, out there who they'll they'll levy fines on people pretty quick if if um, if they get a, a notice in the mail or whatever, and then nothing happens within 48 hours, uh, and they get they start getting fees um, tacked on. On a daily basis, for every day that that lawn's not mowed, they'll get another twenty dollars put on, or whatever heck it is. I don't even know anymore. But my my point is, th there's there's it's probably really touchy, and you have to be careful on all of this. I understand for what reason this is happening, and that's where your intervention comes in. Yeah, every case is different. Every case Some of them is probably are very difficult. Right? Like hoarding cases are always very difficult, and in those type of cases, sometimes. When we deal with hoarding, for example, we'll have all three divisions right here working on the case with Can't our imagine. environmental health officers trying to, to get the family involved, get the needs met, try to help make sure we're supporting them. Those cases that you have that are just um, ignoring and, you know, uh, intentionally not doing, you know, not the ones that we're talking about here, my, my hope is that we can find a way to stop those easier, quicker, give you a little bit more horsepower somehow to stop those things from happening. Because would yeah. you agree that there are some cases where people just are blatantly like, no, I don't want to do it? Yeah, and those we issue citations and we take them to our adjudication system right now. Uh, it used to be we had to go to the third municipal district uh, to, for those court cases. But now we can bring them right here to Village Hall and adjudication, and it's a quicker process, I think. Great. Um, that's, how we, that's our end to noncompliant people. And then uh, the last thing I wanted to ask, how far away are we from being able to do something that used to happen a long time ago with the recycling where there were deposits on bottles and cans and maybe even plastic bags? I mean, is that something that, I, obviously it's a state thing, but how, how, how does that even bottle happen? Bottle bills have came and gone, and that's usually a state level. Yeah. Uh, just like we were talking about with the Environmental Commission now wanting us to support uh, the bag fee, that's the newest thing that they're talking about doing, mm -hmm. uh, trying to uh, educate, or in this case, it would be encouraging people to bring your bags to the grocery store, your reusable bags, so you're not just constantly bringing home plastic bags that you don't know great. what to do with. Yeah. And uh, so most of that occurs at the state level. Hmm. So there's nothing we could do to start a grassroots effort on that, I suppose, right? Uh, we could, we can, sure. We could, uh, depending on what the interest is of the board, we could, we have our, we have options to discuss any type of recycling initiative. Yeah, it, it, clearly, it, I mean, our kids and our kids' kids, this is just going to get worse and worse and worse as time goes on. And if we start, if we don't start controlling this plastic, and it's just going to get bad, really mm -hmm. bad, really fast. So, okay, th thanks for everything you do, James. You bet. Thank you. Trustee Padovani. Uh, thank you, James. Thank you, all the staff. You guys do a wonderful job, and uh, we're very fortunate to have you guys and the department that you're uh, and the services you provide. A uh, lot of great questions here before, so I'm going to focus in on just a couple of things here. Um, in the area of recycling, um, what's going on with electronics? You know, people have a TV. Uh, yes. What do we do nowadays? We have options. Uh, the Solid Waste Agency in Northern Cook County has collection locations. One is uh, their material recovery facility where you can take, I believe, the items on Saturday. It's on our uh, website. Uh, so you can take them over there for free. Uh, some communities have drop-offs. I think Mount Prospect does, which is pretty close at their public works facility. So if you have hours, you're, because they're a member community, we could take it there. And then uh, Groot, uh, at the curbside, if you call them and you tell them you want 
recycle or your electronics picked up they take six items and I'd have to look on the brochure but I think it's for like $31 so you can put your TVs you can gather six items in your house and put them at the curb for collection that's another option okay thank you mm -hmm. and then uh, by the way I'd like to mention that I've used uh, the senior health insurance program counselors at um, the senior center for selection of Medicare plans I'll call them okay. um, and my wife and I both um, went to them and asked them about not only the supplemental plans but the Part D drug uh, the drug plans there's so many of them and it's so complex with uh, all the ins and outs and um, not only were they really, really helpful, but they walked us through the uh, software, um, the websites that uh, came out with the, the best options and gave us the choices. And after it clarified for us what the, op the best options were for us, it was real easy to decide. So I, I can't compliment those folks enough, and that is such a great service for any of the seniors going on to Medicare or thinking about changing their Medicare plans. Great place to go. Um, I'd recommend it to everybody. So um, also, um, one last question. There was a, um, under the nursing services, there's a, an emergency preparedness program. Um, could you talk a little more about that? Yeah, we have a pharmaceutical distribution portion of the, uh, our emergency preparedness in the community. Uh, right now we have a large site in the, in the community that if we needed to do mass distribution of pharmaceuticals, uh, whether it be injections or dispersal of pills, uh, we would use that site. Actually, we were just in uh, correspondence with them today because uh, they gave us a few dates in the summer, and I know there, there's a lot going on at, at this facility during the summertime, so we were hoping to maybe help them to move it back into the fall uh, where we're going to do a walkthrough. Uh, so this location has two spots where you could do a drive-through. So if we had to disperse pills, medication, we would get the, uh, we'd get all the medications in an emergency situation for Cook County Department of Public Health. We could do drive-through so nobody has to get out of their car and we could disperse medication. If it's an injections, then they would have to go in the building and we have a plan, uh, that you would walk through in a setup for uh, getting your injections and we want to practice that. So one of the things, Cook County Department of Public Health, their emergency preparedness coordinator is new. She just started with them and she wanted to walk through the site as well. And we work with Mick Fleming. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Mick. He oversees emergency preparedness for our community and six or seven others. And uh, he's working with us on that as well. So that's our portion of that and our nurses are highly involved in that process. Okay. And in the vaccination clinic that is now over in the Hoffman Estates area, um, is that somewhere where people can go to get you know, measles vac vaccinations? Uh, not measles vaccinations, but maybe where would you want they go to tell for them what they can get there? The Hoffman Estates Clinic is also, you have to meet eligibility guidelines. So you have to have, um, it's called Title versus, there's a Title 21 and a Title 19 in your Medicaid, many, many kinds of plans there. What happened that forced us to close is then they had to limit it to only Title 19. So it was very difficult since we don't bill any provider for us to determine all these different providers and are you eligible or are you not. If they're eligible, yes, they would get the MMR vaccine. So you're really talking about uh, people who have Medicaid. And these are only up to through the age of 19. Right, right. Uh, right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Anything further? Chester Rosenberg. So, James, I saw recently that some community was still offering to take household batteries. Is that something that's out there anywhere that we're just not being able to take Yeah, they've use changed of? the procedures for batteries. Now everything, if you want to continue to recycle with household batteries. They put them in 55 gallon drums. So you have to have a facility that uh, wants to take that on because you're gonna have to be lifting its batteries are extremely health, right. extremely heavy. So we can no longer do that in the health department because of the new requirements they placed on the battery program. So we're only doing the, the green batteries. And Swank is not doing that either. <coughs> uh, Swank still offers it. If you, wanna, if you want to participate, you have to like I say, you have to have a, a location that wants to do it that's going to 
you're going to fill these big drums and and uh, then they'll you have to take them to the site and so forth. J James, correct me if I'm wrong, but non-rechargeable batteries they they can be landfilled, correct? They can be landfilled. Yeah. Yes. So the only ones that are recycled are rechargeable batteries. So if you have regular batteries just from a flash lever, you can put those in just in the garbage. Yes. But is, so Swank's not taking regular household batteries? Uh, like I say, they, that option is still available to us. Okay. We just can no longer do it in the health department because of the right. new requirements they've placed on it. But if you it. took them to Swank, they would take them? <clears throat> uh, Swank, uh, I don't know if they have a... I'd have to check to see if they have their own drop-off location. There are communities that we're willing to take on that requirement, the, the change in the requirements, uh, but we can't do it in our health department. Okay. If you can let me know, that would be great. Thanks. Okay. Okay, if nothing further, thanks, James and okay. team. Thank you. Thank you. Next, the Building and Life Safety Department, Steve. Thank you. Evening, everybody. James. <coughs> run right after Randy. Yeah. Yeah. Or do I got to? Oh, that's all right. Excellent evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, especially uh, pleased to be in front of our new trustees, Pat Avani and Canty and Schwingbeck. Um, we've had a little opportunity to meet, but um, I'm hoping um, what I present tonight will give you a little bit more insight as to what the department does. Um, but I'm sure I'll leave some gaps for sure. So uh, I ask that you and as well as the rest of the board, please uh, feel free to ask questions as we're uh, going through uh, the presentation. I think it's uh, sometimes a little bit easier to uh, talk on point when we're, we're on a particular issue. So please don't hesitate to interrupt me and uh, ask a question. Real quickly, um, here's a picture of our hardworking team. Um, with me tonight is Mark Fink, the assistant building official. Um, so uh, hopefully he won't have to answer any questions, but uh, he's here in case I need him. So what do we do? Uh, key services and functions of the building department. Um, in short, we ensure uh, the safety of our built environment. Um, we do that through uh, what I would say three key functions. Uh, the review and inspection of construction that goes on in the village. Um, we monitor our existing buildings, our existing systems, and uh, as well as the properties, of course, that the buildings are on. And then um, <clears throat> the way we do that is by maintaining the building standards that we actually enforce. So here's just a quick shot of a blueprints that are waiting to be reviewed in the middle there um, and on the outside are just some uh, quick examples of what can be the complex details that get involved with projects whether it's uh, plumbing diagrams or electrical or uh, structural framing and whatnot so um, our plan reviewers make sure we go through these plans and make sure they are um, compliant with our code um, it's very important to do have this process in uh, to do the plan review as part of the construction process because it's a much more efficient way to assure uh, things are being going to be done to code. Uh, much easier to fix things with a uh, pen and paper than with a sawzall. Um, uh, as well, trying to evaluate all the variables once construction is started is practically impossible and would likely lead to uh, much expensive rework. So um, while this process does take some time to get through, it still ends up really being a more efficient way of doing it than trying field handling problems. So um, 
Next, after, of course, the permits are issued, uh, construction starts, our inspectors go out into the field and um, during certain stages of construction, uh, look at the work being done and assure that it's being done properly and to code. Uh, whether it's our underground piping up in the top right or um, our roughs, would be it electrical, plumbing, framing um, on the top left um, to, you know, broader uh, multifamily developments and, you know, making sure such things as, uh, heck, even this, you know, it's being placed in the right place when they start pouring the building, be sure the setbacks are proper, things of that nature. Um, and then something even as simple as a patio being poured, which is in the bottom right corner there. So I guess I want to hit on some real quick points of, it's commonly asked, uh, why are there such complexities that go on with inspections? It's all been reviewed already. It should be uh, easy and just smooth flowing. Well, I'll throw out a couple just quick examples of things that occur. Uh, be it that it's patio season, it's a, it's a really good one to use. Um, <clears throat> when folks are trying to <coughs> design their new dream, addition, home, patio area, whatever the case may be, they're often doing it either by themselves or, or quite often with a design professional. <coughs> Um, what design professionals and contractors are trained in is, and from experience, they can visualize things in three dimensions very much more easily than a person who's going through this the first time. So quite often what happens is we get through the process and they are trying to imagine something on a two-dimensional set of plans. When it actually starts getting built, the reality becomes, oh, I didn't realize that was only that big, or I want more space here, or I wish we did this or that. It's much more easy to visualize once it starts becoming three-dimensional. And then they want changes, particularly with patios. They sound really big, but it's 50 square feet or 100 square feet, and then you realize just how much space a table and six chairs that you actually have to pull out from the table to sit down at um, takes to, to function properly and comfortably. So what quite often happens is then after a set of plans has come through, been approved, um, homeowners decides, ah, oh, they see it framed out and they go, ah, oh, that's not big enough, make it bigger. Well, contractor just does it and whatever. Well, once the inspectors get out there, they say, hey, this isn't what got approved, it's too big, we gotta stop what we're doing. Come in, submit new plans, but it's all very important that that's done because in looking at all this, we're making sure our lock coverage is proper. We're making sure that our, our, our water flows through our yards are proper, that it doesn't cause flooding on our neighbors and things of that nature. So while it might seem like this simple job is being delayed, in fact, it's very important that we go through the process and look at these types of things so we don't uh, um, poorly affect our neighbors. Um, another thing that happens typically in construction, particularly existing construction, but sometimes even with new construction, are just unforeseeable conditions. Until you open that wall, you don't know what's inside of it. We open up walls for remodels and we find that mm, the previous work, they horribly chopped up some of the framing members that weren't anticipated needed to be fixed once we saw them, but once the inspectors see them, we can't just allow it to be closed back up. It's 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 crucial, critical part of the building, and we got to make sure it's being done right and safe. So, in many cases, that involves having them engage the design professional again because we can't design it for them out in the field. Sometimes it's simple, and we can we 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 will help. But in many times, um, it's. It's important and critical that the inspectors are not doing design work for, for our owners because um, not only is it possible they could make a mistake and then the village would be liable for it, um, there's the element of value engineering our projects. The inspector might recommend some great beam that would be code compliant, but it might also be a very expensive beam that if the homeowner or contractor doesn't do their homework, 
they'll find out later usually that, wow, they could have did it a lot cheaper. And then, of course, they want to come back and want the village to pay for the cost of the difference for the village making those types of recommendations. So um, inspectors are very much discouraged from making uh, uh, design uh, um, promises out in the field or, or making, you know, help offering design uh, for the for projects. Again, that delays our projects through the through the plan review process and people do get upset by it but it ultimately leads to a safe and proper um, project that is good for the long term of the village so um, lastly I just want to quickly touch on the fact that uh, not only do we go out during the construction. Our inspectors are always available, as well as anyone in our team, uh, for pre-construction meetings. We love to meet with the contractors, developers, um, owners, whatever the case may be, to meet before the construction project starts and go over what the expectations of the inspectors are, uh, you know, talk about any potential challenges with look logistics or, or, or anything that might uh, be a hiccup through the course of a project. So um, we're, we, we do do that and we don't charge people anything extra for nothing because it's, it's worth the time and effort to do that. So so then once our buildings are built, certain systems and parts of them have to be maintained. Particularly, um, you see on the left a fire sprinkler system or a fire alarm control panel top right or a, or a suppression system for, co for cooking in the bottom right. Um, the way we, I'm going to touch on how we do that in a little bit, so I'll, I'll just tell you what we do and get into it. More generally, what we do as well as um, we perform uh, periodic inspections of all our uh, businesses and multifamily buildings. Um, we get out there and, and walk the site, look around and make sure things like proper use of extension cords, um, clearance in front of electrical panels, uh, fire extinguishers are in place and properly tested, and exit doors are not being blocked for safety of the residents. Um, and those are just, that's obviously a very small list of many things we will look at and pay attention to when we're walking sites. So to the standards, how do we determine what is safe in the village? Well, a lot of the way we do that is use model codes. Um, Many, many and most of the codes you see here are pretty much uni used universally across the country, coast to coast now. Um, starting in about the year 2000, three, there were three major code uh, groups, uh, building code groups across the country that all joined together and formed one group, which is now called the International Code Council. Uh, that has been a great benefit to the industry as a whole because we have consistency generally from coast to coast as to how codes are applied and the formulas are the same and the charts are the same and the requirements are the same so a contractor moving across state lines or going anywhere is, is going to see generally the same type of code and the way the codes applied. With that said, we sure do have local amendments that um, modify the model codes, but um, more and more as an industry as a whole, we're seeing a um, uh, unification of, of the codes, which, which is a good thing for the industry um, and, and does help us. Uh, with that said, there's a lot to know. Um, as you can see from the rainbow up here, there's just these books alone is over almost 8,000 pages of information uh, regarding technical information about all the types of systems we have in our buildings. Uh, fire alarm systems, our building systems, fuel, gas, mechanical, even our energy codes, um, swimming pools, property maintenance, electrical, so on and so forth. So 
Um, we go through these codes and we look at them and we make sure uh, we see how they've been changed. We, they're on a, typically on a three-year cycle on the, on the model codes. So we're currently on the 2009 version of the codes and we'll be looking uh, very soon to go to the 2018 um, version of the codes. We're in the process right now of going through these books, comparing the old ones to the new ones, looking at all our existing amendments, um, seeing if they're still applicable, makes sense, and then making recommendations, which will go before the Building Code Review Board and then ultimately get presented to the Village Board for a final um, a adoption. So, um, additionally, I just want like to make a point that it's not just going through all these code books. There's a lot of time and effort that takes looking at our actual village ordinance as well. Um, a lot of our village ordinance has um, uh, administrative uh, rules for how we do things. For instance, if you read through uh, Chapter 23, Article 1, it will say language to the effect, you must submit three sets of drawings for a residential project. That's in our current code now. Well, I'm looking at those types of things, and the reality is some residential projects I only need two sets of plans, some residential projects I need six sets of plans, depending on the complexity. But we have this sort of stock rule built into our ordinance that makes it then difficult for staff to make a proper adjustment to reality. So we're looking at fixing things like that as well. So those types of things are also important to help streamline our processes. This isn't just about the technical nature of the codes, um, but it's, it, it's also about looking at how we can streamline our processes to help better serve our customers as well. So. So real quickly, just a couple points on workload and performance. I think these two uh, key points here are kind of hit home and tell us where things are at construction-wise. In general, uh, everything's been unprecedented for what we're dealing with today. Uh, first uh, graph you see here is our uh, just total plan reviews that we're doing. and. Um, last year we did over 6,000 plan reviews. In 2017, we did 6,300. Um, you can see relative years prior to that, 2012, 2013, sitting around 4,000. So, you know, depending on how you want to do the math, we're probably sitting somewhere around a 20 to 40 percent increase in, in our workload and plan reviews. And then similarly with inspections, um, again, last year over 17,000 um, inspections were done, whereas comparatively to 2012, 2013, we were looking at, you know, 11,000-ish. So uh, it's a very significant increase, again, probably in the neighborhood of, you know, 40% um, workload increase. So what are we doing to deal with these increases? Well, a couple things I'll touch on real quickly. Uh, one thing we're doing is utilizing some third-party services to help supplement our staff. Um, we surely wouldn't be able to keep up with some of the things we're doing without some of that help. A couple different ways we're utilizing third-party services. Um, one, are managing our fire systems testing program, which involves making sure all of our systems that require periodic testing, typically annually, our fire sprinklers, our fire uh, alarms, are getting actually done. We use a third-party company that um, basically, um, you can see right in the middle there, uh, a, a software called the Compliance Engine, which 
uh, in short, uh, has the companies that come out and do the testing log that information into a web-based portal, and then uh, the company, Bricer, they keep track of this information for us and they do follow-up letters and they make phone calls saying, hey, your testing hasn't been done, so on and so forth. In essence, they're doing administrative work for us, zero cost to the village. They collect their fees by the testers paying when they make their submissions and they're reasonable amounts. I think it's 15 bucks or something in order to submit a test um, onto the system. So. Uh, no cost to the village, and we get constant and updated reports. Obviously, if things get to a certain point that things are not getting done, we, of course, follow up then with internal staff doing the code enforcement with our businesses and find out why things aren't uh, getting tested and find out if we can help guide them, make sure they understand what needs to be done and, of course, why it needs to be done and what's so important about it. Um, a second thing we've done, and we have our nice picture of the person, our Marianne, who's helping us uh, this year. Uh, starting this year, we brought in um, uh, third-party administrative help to do a lot of data entry work. What that has allowed us to do is keep our inspectors free out in the field doing more inspections, as well as helping um, so say they get done with their inspections for the day, well, they can come back in. They're actually helping with doing actual plan reviews, typically smaller projects, but, you know, we figure it out. And they're able to help us keep that workload up as well. So by um, just having one additional administrative person, we are able to get a lot of uh, uh, skilled work completed and... Um, uh, just something else I didn't mention with our inspections. Our inspections, um, with a rare, very rare exception, are always uh, provided the, the next day. People can call us up to 4 o'clock, and we're out there the next day doing inspections. So um, many other towns don't offer, you know, near that type of quick turnaround. So um, a third thing... Uh, we use third-party services for now is to uh, help supplement some of our front counter operations. Um, it hurts us when anybody takes a vacation or calls in sick. Uh, it really slams us. Uh, if we can plan ahead a little bit, and we did this with an extended outage of a staff member not that long ago, we brought in a third-party person to help supplement our permit technicians and not have the gap where I have to have a supervisor sitting up at the front counter for several weeks while somebody was out with a surgery thing or something like that. So uh, that's been really great and helpful. And um, lastly, we use third-party to uh, supplement our inspections the same way we do with front counter. If an inspector is going to be out, we want to send them to training. Um, it's important. It's important and critical our inspectors get the training. Certain inspectors must maintain their licenses they have, and they have to go to this training. It's not, you know, it's not uh, something they can pick or choose to do. Um, uh, as well as our other inspectors have to maintain CEUs and get enough CEUs in order to maintain the certifications they have. So it's vital and critical inspectors get out, which means we have to send them to training. Um, so we do that uh, without uh, having a gap in our service by bringing in third-party inspectors to um, fill those gaps when we're gone. And as well as if our plan reviews get uh, really, if we hit a spike in the, in the submittals, we can bring in um, third-party plan review help as well. So we're using a lot of these types of services to help our spikes and our peaks, yet without long-term commitments to full-time staff then you know, we might choose to want to, we'd rather use that, those resources somewhere else down the road. Um, some other things we're doing. Uh, we're cross-training our inspectors. And instead of three inspectors having to go out on an inspection, we're trying to get it to be two or one. And, um, and that's been moving along well. 
but we are trying to also be careful and methodical as we do this because we want to be sure our inspectors are comfortable with what they're looking at and maintain the quality of the inspections we have been doing. Um, so we're, we're, while we're doing it, we're again doing it methodically and making sure everybody's comfortable with what they're doing. Um, <clears throat> and one last thing um, that I've brought to the board many times before and stressed is something very important to our department is the utilization of technology. There are a lot of things we can utilize technology to help uh, streamline our processes. Um, one thing we did recently that is uh, estimated to have saved approximately 500 man hours a year, uh, people hours, excuse me, um, <laughs> is uh, we eliminated uh, back routing from plans. What does that mean? Old way. Old way. Plans came into the building department, got sent out to the other departments, be it planning, health department, um, public works, engineering. And then when they got done with those plan reviews, those folks would have to walk those plans back to the building department, put them in a bin. Our staff would then have to pull those out of the bin, figure out what they went with, resort stuff, reorganize it, put it back, and then file it back away. We don't have to do any of that anymore. Um, plans go out and they do not need to be rerouted because once things are signed off in the computer, we are using reporting systems to tell us that that work is all done. And we know when the last person is clicked off the button on the list and it shows up on the next list to continue with the next set, set of processing. So. Um, 500 hours might be an underestimation because it also saves all the other departments time. Um, as well, recently I, I heard uh, one of the staff members um, say, oh, what's, what else is great about it is I get to keep the set of plans here so when if so, I, I deny something and the revision comes in, I now have that old set of plans to compare and make sure that things are happening the way they're supposed to be happening. While it doesn't happen all the time, on occasion, uh, we'll say, hey, we need to fix five things. Well, the design professional fixes seven. <laughs> and we don't always catch those last two because they might not be well noted on the set of plans and whatnot. And then, of course, it can be an oversight that becomes a problem later. And then everybody wonders what happened when we're at the 11th hour trying to get a certificate of occupancy. So this, you know, this not only has an efficiency, but a, a, a quality ish, um, improvement as well. So um, it's, it's, it's pretty neat. And that's just one example of many ways we're using, uh, just using our system to better manage and track and control our workflows and stay on top of things better. So some key accomplishments over 2017-2018. Um, quickly, these were basically the strategic goals I laid out for the department. I'll just quickly touch base on each one of them. Um, I don't have any pretty pictures for some of these because, I don't know, there weren't pretty pictures for some of <laughs> them. Um, as James mentioned earlier, we did, we worked together collaboratively with the health department on the reevaluation of uh, our code enforcement process. Um, of course, as James also mentioned, this also involved working with police planning and public works. Um, and it was great. Everybody worked together and we, you know, collaborated to come up with what we felt was a better, more efficient matrix of handling things um, to better match responsibilities, the skill sets, as well as commonly overlapping issues, as James pointed out, with uh, uh, typical scrape and paints and grass, high grass and weeds, right? They, they quite often go together. So um, since the health inspectors are out there handling one issue, they're also then handling the other issues instead of a separate building uh, inspector going out. Now, of course, if they discover things, our 
uh, above and beyond just the scrape and paint. And of course, we collaborate. They call us out. We come out and we deal with the things we're we're most adept at. So um, I think we're definitely seeing some some benefits, improvements, and. Uh, uh, better communication again with our residents because we have one point of contact dealing with multiple issues instead of multiple people throwing different lists at our residents. Um, to our fire safety assessment. Uh, the fire safety assessment involved two, two key steps. Um, the first step was a, a community risk assessment. And what does that mean? It means we go out and look and count all our buildings and uh, similar to health, assign them a, a risk category. Um, certain buildings are at higher risk uh, and, and, and more danger, such as larger assemblies or, or restaurants that have more greater potential for fire, things of that nature. And certain things have lower risk, your typical office spaces, whatnot. Um, with knowing that information, we were then able to apply uh, suggested um, periodic inspections, uh, uh, tables, uh, schedules, if you will, to all the buildings and determine the resources that were necessary to accomplish what what should get accomplished based on, on the model code's recommendations um, and make sure we get to all our buildings in time and, and, and don't, you know, don't fall behind in getting to look at all our buildings. Um, customer surveys, uh, or what I changed to as a customer feedback system, I think is a better term for it. Um, We've had this up and running for a while now. Uh, we originally started about a year and a half ago now, I would say, um, with getting feedback from customers, um, interactions from the front counter staff. Um, basically, they can go on the website or they can do it manually as well, but most people choose the website. Um, as a matter of fact, everybody chose the website. Um, and they just answered really three basic questions. Did you get what you came for and did you get good service and, you know, things along those lines. Um, additionally, we've added a, a couple additional feedbacks at different points of our process. Uh, we added it at the plan review stage. So every plan review letter that goes out includes, hey, please fill out a feedback. Tell us what you think about um, the plan review. Uh, asking such questions as if, do you think the things we're asking for are relevant? Um, you know, getting that type of feedback from our design professionals. And then as well, at the end of our jobs, when they either get final inspections or CEOs, uh, people are able to tell us about their, you know, you know, their full experience, but how, how everything went with, you know, getting the whole job done. Um, and we're getting, I will say, generally, not a lot, but what we have gotten has all been very positive feedback for the most part. So um, trying to be very careful that we're not biased in how we're getting the information. So we're trying to be very cautious and make sure we're getting a, um, a balanced uh, feel from all, uh, all our folks. And, um, but we'll, keep, we'll always keep monitoring that and um, uh, making sure that uh, we're, we're, we are getting that feedback and, and looking to get it from everybody. Again, quickly, uh, technology advancements. While listed as a strategic goal, um, technology advancements, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a lot more we can do. And um, it's going to remain a key focus for us as we, as we go forward. Um, We've utilized some very powerful business analytic tools to help explain some of the things I've uh, just explained with back routing and, and managing our workload. Um, but there's a lot more we can do um, and, and a lot more that we're going to do. And I just um, 
want to let you know that we need to keep improving. I'm going to talk a little bit more about technology um, with our future initiatives. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, we are in the process, uh, one we have not completed but are in the process of is updating our building codes. It's my goal to try and get that to the board by early fall and um, it's going to be a lot of hard work getting there but progress is already being made. Some stuff has been presented to the building code review board so um, I think we're going to get on a roll here and be able to start having some really good meetings and get a lot of stuff done and be hopefully ready to present to the board by, by early fall. Just a quick shot, there is our, uh, there's our web page where we um, have people come to provide feedback for us. So some of our challenges. Obviously our workload's been high. Um, we've had quite a significant amount of staff turnover uh, since I've started here. Um, and while it's gave us great opportunities to do some restructuring and things we wanted, it also comes with it the, the learning curves of new people, um, getting everybody up to speed. Um, and then, of course, you know, all these things go together. High workload, staff turnover, and we're restructuring the department. So we're trying to figure out how to do things in a new way while we're still trying to keep up with the old workload. And so it's definitely been a challenge. And, you know, staff surely understandably gets frustrated with, um, with, with all that's going on. But um, I think we've been managing it, managing it pretty well. And uh, we've had some uh, good team building sessions with the team to try and get us all a little bit on, more on the same page. And uh, we've had some uh, pretty cool sessions that we did some neat, you know, exercises and stuff. So uh, we're trying to do things like that to make sure uh, the team stays um, healthy and functional. Um, a second challenge we're having is we're generally seeing a diminishing quality of construction in general. Um, I think it's no surprise uh, if nobody will be surprised to hear that the millennial generation is generally not moving into the trades as, a, as an occupation and with that we're seeing anybody you know uh, builders and developers were will hire anybody to get their projects done and with that comes a natural diminishment of the quality of the work that goes on because people just don't come with the background training skill sets that they used to. So um, this obviously makes uh, particularly the inspection process much more tedious. You have to spend a lot more time walking them through why things are wrong, explaining it to them. Um, and that takes more time. So, um, and of course, it also uh, raises emotional levels naturally. Um, people want to move their projects along, and we want them to move their projects along, but we want them to move along safely. So, um, it's important that we uh, go through this process and uh, do our best to try and educate people. Um, and while promoting technology is an awesome thing that we need to do as an organization, the challenge that comes with it is we're trying to make a big leap. I think our, our system we've had here in place that manages our, our permitting software has been here a very long time. The architecture's antiquated, the system's antiquated, it doesn't bode well for doing many of the types of uh, things modern technologies do, online processing, payments, um, GIS mapping, all the other things that go along with it. So um, it's going to be uh, very important that not do we just bring in new technology, but we have to be committed to providing training to um, the people that are here because um, 
I, I believe as an organization we lack a little in some basic fundamentals for a lot of the staff and it's very frustrating for them to be thrown this giant new wonderful software that they've got no basis about and it's not just teaching them that particular software simple things like electronic file management they don't have basics for um, I think we can make improvements there so I just um, I just want to bring that up as a very important issue um, if we're going to make some of the um, awesome leaps we want to make we got to be committed as an organization to providing the resources necessary to train uh, the staff as a whole so back a little bit to uh, diminished skill sets uh, the picture on your top left um, you probably can't see it very well but um, you see that wall that had to be uh, cut back open. Um, it had a, this work was caught being done without permit, and <coughs> of course this was a new um, sliding glass door cut into an exterior wall. Well, until we cut this open, we didn't know. We wouldn't have known that this was a um, masonry constructed house. This wasn't um, this wasn't a stick built wood frame constructed house. It's a masonry masonry house, which is not all that uncommon, but um, it's more common to see uh, a wood construction. Um, all those cement blocks that are above that door are basically floating there. Right above that on the outside are the roof rafters that sit on top of that. Had we not made them open this, those, those masonry blocks in that roof would have eventually uh, collapsed. Might not have collapsed all the way to the ground, but it surely would have collapsed on top of the door, potentially trapping people inside or maybe potentially injuring somebody. So um, the fact that a contractor would do something that I think even to an average person could see that you need some type of support there is, um, well, to be quite honest, it's kind of sad. But it is also shows why it's important we uh, make people open things when they do work without permits because severe things of this nature can be hidden behind, you know, what appears to be a simple piece of drywall. So. Um, and the one on the right shows, you know, a stud that's basically being supported on a, a tiny little flimsy piece of plywood that was cut for the floor and, you know, obviously isn't going to support very much at all. So, um, again, these types of things are poor workmanship that will be hidden inside our buildings and um, some poor new owner will be the one who ends up paying for it down the road somewhere. So. So some of our potential initiatives we're talking about. Um, first three things I really have up on the list are all, I would say, technology uh, rated, uh, related, excuse me. Um, online permitting. We would love to give people the ability to pull a permit in their PJs at 2 in the morning. You know, that's great service, right? We're always, we're always open. Um, I think that speaks for itself. Um, as, as James showed you, using field devices is something we would love to be able to do and utilize those same similar technologies you, you saw James present. Being able to snap a photograph of a violation and have it built right into an inspection report, again, pictures worth a thousand words. Um, it would help with communications a lot and it would help um, uh, move our projects along faster um, because the contractor wouldn't have to call the office to talk to the inspector to figure out what he was trying to write when he was writing a, a field note. Um, and then more generally, just centralization of all our records. We manage a lot of paper and um, 
that paper's value is valuable, important information, uh, not just to the public, but to us. We use it all the time. Uh, referencing work that was done on a permit on a house five years ago when a new permit's coming in for something, seeing what was done, seeing what was previously approved, being able to find and access that information quickly and efficiently will help us operate more quickly and efficiently. And um, that's just the tip of the iceberg um, with all the types of things we could do. Um, we could access approved plans out in the field um, instead of denying some uh, uh, failing an inspection because we don't have an, a, approved plans out on site, um, which happens quite often, by the way. Um, as much as we try and educate everybody at the front counter, the critical importance of doing that, uh, we just do not have the time to pull everybody's sets of plans to review them before we go out and do inspections for the day. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to get any half the amount of inspections done. Um, beyond that, we don't want to be taking um, the clean village records out of the office, losing them, having them fall out of the car in the mud, things of that nature, because those are our, our vital records, and um, it, it's, it, it's not worth the risk of losing or, or damage, having them damaged out in the field. So that would be another really neat thing we could do, um, getting all that done with, uh, and that would fall kind of underneath our, our laser fish system, which I believe you know is all you all know is underway already. Um, something else we're looking at as kind of is lines up with our with our code uh, our code review is looking at el potentially eliminating some of our low value requirements. Um, while no decisions have been made yet, for example, we're looking at roofing permits. While we do go out and do a final inspection on the roofs when they're completed and on a rare occasion, we catch some really shoddy work or somebody who didn't do something right. For the most part, um, we don't see too much that's wrong with roofs. And the reality is a lot of what's important with a roof is what we can't see, the underlayment. So there's no way we can get out and do underlayment inspections people doing roofs through the course of the year would be way too resource intensive and you'd basically have to park somebody on the job all day to make sure they're doing it right. So um, be it the fact that roofers are state licensed, um, we're considering possibility of uh, eliminating the requirements for roofs. That's probably six to seven hundred permits a year. Of course there's permit fees that come with that, but there's the offsetting cost of not having to go out and do the inspections that go with it. There's cost of not having a permit tech have to deal or handle with the paperwork, seven, six, seven hundred people at the counter. Um, that frees them up to spend more time with the jobs that are a little bit more complex and make sure plans are getting routed to all the right departments and then we're collecting all the right information and doing that faster and more efficiently. So um, just one example. And last but not least, um, you know, in looking to deal with some of the diminishing quality out there is to maybe provide some better code training opportunities, be it uh, seminars that we put on in-house, invite contractors to come and talk about codes. We could, you know, go over things we are finding are common recurring problems out in the field and um, things of that nature. We could do that not only um, uh, in-house, we could possibly even create webinars, videos, uh, things along those lines. Um, uh, and not only maybe for technical training, but even, you know, homeowner coming in, how do I get a permit, things of that nature, help them know and understand what the process is all about. So looking at some ways of, again, back to education. It's always about education, making sure people know what we do, why we do it, and, of course, how to do it as quickly and efficiently as possible. And that's it for me. Any questions? Well, thanks, Steve. That was a lot of information. And so um, 
Let me see who has the first question. Trustee <laughs> Tenalia. Thanks, Steve. Um, <clears throat> I think everyone in the room here knows this is my world. This is my life. Steve and I spent a lot of time together. And um, as boring and as a terrible as some of this stuff is, it's all necessary. It's all important. Everything that Steve's team does is critical to the safety of everybody in town here. There are, I've noticed it. I'm glad you brought it up. There are issues with the quality of workmanship out there right now. Uh, I think due to 07 and 08, a lot of uh, people left the industry. There's a lot of folks out there who are having a hard time finding good quality laborers and carpenters and drywallers and it's not an easy industry right now and you guys get you know get to deal with so many of those pieces of the puzzle behind the counter reviewing plans inspecting the work it's not easy i don't know how you do all that you do uh in a weekly basis with the, the amount of staff that you have um so i've, I've mentioned it to you before if mike cedar was here as uh trustee baldino said the other night is uh, you know there are times when you need to ask and you need to ask if, if it's, if it's, and you've said it before, you know, you're going through these growing pains and learning pains and you needed a little bit of time to get settled and know what you need. And I'm hoping that that's now, you know, that we can get you set up with what you need to do the jobs. Um, so a couple of points I wanted to make. Uh, some of the things that Steve's um, department offers is not just pre-construction meetings, but pre-design meetings. Sure. Uh, a larger project, it, it, it behooves the, the design professionals and the, the people who are investing all of this money to go and sit with his department to, to talk about how the nuts and bolts of this building and this project are gonna go together so that when the plan review is done, it's a little bit smoother. Sure. Just like what you mentioned a minute ago here, Later on, when we're about to start construction, you'll meet with the contractors and the developers, people who are on the field out there with your inspectors so that the inspections go smoother and they know when to call for inspections. They know, you know, about what kinds of things they'll be looking for and so on. And it makes life a little better. So communication, I guess, is the key to all of that up front and later on. So the more of those kinds of things that you can do with all of the different builders and architects and designers and owners and developers out there it's i think that just helps everyone so well and to elaborate on that a little bit we have a plan review committee and it's not just the building department we we meet um twice a twice a month um and any design professional or you know somebody coming in can come to their project and they sit with representatives from everybody in the department in, in the village not not just the building department planning police fire health who else am i missing public works everybody's there and they can present their project and this way we can deal with potentially overlapping issues um, you know you do something with drainage it affects something with engineering it affects something with public work so uh, affects something with fire department access all of those types of things so um, it's a it's a great thing we do and and do offer everybody yeah, and, as well and it's not just the building department it is the vill it is a village initiative it's it's all departments I've been to those many times and um, as I think James mentioned earlier, and we talked with, with him about his department, uh, there's so many things going on, it's hard to communicate all these things. How, do, how does everybody know that these things are available um, to go and do these kinds of meetings? I, I, I suspect uh, some of your bigger challenges are those folks and those submittals that don't understand all of these potential tools that they have in their tool belt to use and sure. that you offer. Um, so my, my, my thought is communication, spreading out workshops. Um, you did about a year ago or more, you had like a little town hall meeting with all the developers and architects, and it was about getting input from them. What were they seeing as troubling in the field what were they seeing that was troubling in the office for reviews and so forth? Will you be doing another one of those sometime soon? 
I don't have anything specifically planned, but I agree with you. It was very valuable and would like to do some more for sure. And I, I will lo look to implement those. I, I think if I could, if I could offer this idea, um, when we submit plans, oftentimes uh, there, there's a feeling of adding code comments on there because what happens is in the field, the people doing it may not know how to do a fireplace exactly the way the fireplace sure. flu should be put together. So we have to put all these notes and all these details. And Deb Pierce is wonderful about making sure all this stuff gets put on the plans. Sure. Our plans start looking like a, a Bible at some point. And I'm wondering, is, is, is it possible that we could find a way to gather up all the guys who are doing this work? They're licensed in our town, right? I mean, sure. if, if you're a builder and you're going to get a permit, you're going to have to have some kind of a license to, to do, do this work, right? Yes. I mean, you have a, you, you have a general built business license. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe, maybe to have, be a preferred builder in Arlington Nights, you attend a couple seminars a year. And these seminars talk a little bit about what, hey, in Arlington Nights, we value these kinds of processes and procedures in the field so that when you call us for inspections, they go smoothly. And the more that these folks know ahead of time, the smoother it all go. Absolutely. So I guess it just boils down to that same word again, communication and yeah. sharing, because there's, there's so much. There's just so much. So... Um, you, your guys and Mr. Fink have caught a number of things on projects that I was not out there to catch, but after your guys did, it was like, wow, I can't believe those guys did that. You know, just to fix a stud in the wall that was not connected properly or floor joist that was not connected properly. And so the guys are doing a great job. Good. Thank you. I appreciate hearing that. That's all I have. Thanks. Dr. Padovani. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm learning a lot every time I listen to you. Um, there's Good. so much here. There's um, so much going on in our village, too, by the way. Um, on there is. individual homeowners, um, small projects, big projects. And as you're all aware of, um, we just, this board just approved the four Block 425 project, yep. which um, is massive, uh, just incredible. Um, how is your department going to handle that? What do you have to do? Do you need more resources? What do you What do you think to, you're going to need on that? Well, I, I believe with the way it's going to come, the way I'm, I believe it's going to get phased in, that we're going to be able to handle it. We may consider doing some outsourcing on the plan review if it's large. And again, it depends on the timing of when things come in. It's a you know our department's a lot about dealing with with peaks peaks and valleys, you know, obviously peaks particularly. Um, and um, if, if necessary, that's why having the uh, relationships with the third party su supplemental help and, you know, knowing, um, you know, the people you're going to use uh, helps with a lot of that sometimes. So when you need them, they're there and, um, you know, you can kind of, seamlessly flow into getting the additional help you need so there's a possibility there and you know if if, if needed on inspections as well um you know we'd probably utilize the same type of same type of services okay because uh, i think this board the town is is moving towards more and more development uh in other areas as well sure and so we want you to tell us if you need more resources or whatever you need uh, so that this, all this great momentum that we're building here, we continue it and um, we actually encourage it. Um, can I go on to the, um, the customer feedback area that you were having, your surveys? Um, how many people, uh, do you know how many people are responding to these, a uh, number? I believe my counter surveys were probably about, I've probably got about 20, 30 of them. Okay. Um, and probably only a handful of the under, under the other two between plan review and uh, final inspections. Okay. Are you seeing any trends or any areas um, that need improvement based on what you're uh, getting back from those? Honestly, no. Honestly, 
they're pretty much all typically very satisfied customers who are filling those out. Is that truly representative of everybody? I doubt it, of course. <laughs> um, but um, uh, no, I'm definitely I'm not getting a lot of, uh, I guess, maybe critical information um, through the feedback uh, system. If I if I could, Trustee Petavani, you know what what Steve is saying is true in terms of those that feedback. It has been overwhelming, um, overwhelmingly positive. But one of the things we've been trying to do is when my office gets a complaint or we feel the complaint from a trustee, um, because we're in the midst of all this process improvement, Steve and I will sit down and we'll meet with the person. And usually, typically, we wait till after they're done. So there's no implication that this person feels pressured anyway. And we, we kind of go through how did this process go for you? And then on a couple of occasions, we found good examples of where you had a perfect storm of things didn't go well or something slipped through the cracks. We actually will bring that person to that plan review committee meeting with all of the departments, have them tell their story because they're done and there's no, you know, they don't have to worry about this impacting their process. And then they leave and then we talk about it and say, okay, how could we have prevented this from happening? Or, you know, was it bad luck? Was there's not, there's nothing you can do to prevent it. Um, you know, and, and, and so we try to take, aside from that kind of quantitative data, which you are getting overwhelmingly po positive, we take the qualitative storytelling aspect, the anecdotes, and try to learn from those as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, the online permitting, uh, getting a permit at 2, <laughs> two o'clock in the morning, it's a great idea. Um, I've heard they do that in Chicago. How close are we for that? Uh, that would be something I believe we would need to uh, implement if we bring in a new ERP system. Okay, as part of the larger ERP yeah, project. For, okay. Definitely, for sure. All right, and um, I think that's all I have. Thank you, Mayor. Trustee Labez. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for all you do and all your department does. I have to say, reading the report as someone who doesn't have a lot of interaction with your, your department, I it was really eye-opening to see how much is goes on and I too have concerns um, to make sure you have the resources staffing levels whatever especially as we go into these big projects like Arlington uh, you know 425 and the Kensington Hickory thing that's coming along and one Arlington place having more and hopefully more things on the south side of town I mean it's we are fortunate to be looking at kind of a nice sort of explosion of, of development so, so I do support looking, you know, watching what um, your, your needs are. Um, and I just want to ask one quick question. Why is there a reduction in elevator inspections? I noticed on the chart it went down from like 97 uh, to 50, and I didn't think there, there are fewer elevators, are there? Um, those are not annual elevator inspections. Those are permit elevator inspections. Ah, okay. Those are for permits. That means if they came in to pull a permit to do some oh. work or change it, that's yeah, that does not represent our annual program. Okay, I was assuming it was annual ones, and I thought aren't elevators inspected nope, every year? Nope, that's strictly so. permit okay. work. Okay, yep. thank you for that clarification. Sure. That's it. Okay, Justice Schwinger back. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Steve, th I mean, this is an area that um, uh, that I'm I'm. Uh, very involved in not only as a homeowner doing projects but having been on the zoning board the last four years um, we I mean we want to encourage projects in our community it's good for our community as far as people um, fixing up their homes uh, taking empty lots and building homes on them and increasing property taxes and we saw people uh, um, bringing projects to us where they would take a um, a single family ranch house put in two stories I mean that increases property taxes and we want the process to be as smooth as possible so looking at your challenges and reading here where you're talking about uh, skilled tradesmen um, I'm guessing that that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on your resources which are your inspectors out in the field um, 
So I know when uh, people are going to use a contractor that are, are not permitted in Arlington Heights, uh, they have to get them to fill out some paperwork and get approved to do work in Arlington Heights. And from what I've gathered, there's not a lot of background checks on those contractors. It's simply filling out some paperwork and paying a, a fee to get permitted. That's correct. So I, I guess what I would like to ask you is um, if there's nothing we can do up front with contractor other than get them permitted where they can start doing work, I would imagine that your department has a tremendous amount of experience with contractors once they start doing work in Arlington Heights. And when we look at all these projects all over our village, there are contractors who are messy. There's contractors that uh, don't clean up the roads. There's contractors that get started and their projects last forever. We talked a little bit about that when we met um, a month and a half ago. Um, so I would imagine that as people do work in our village, uh, the ones that do good work and have everything up front from the very get-go, they're not putting as much drain on your resources as the contractors that don't do a very good job. That's a, that's a fair assessment. So my question or thought is, when we see these contractors that are doing this work and you talk about this generation today not going into the trades where it's putting a, 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 a big demand on your inspectors. When we see these contracts, I think we ask the question, um, can we limit them from doing work in our village? Does it ever get to the point where we take them off an approval list and we don't allow them to, to do work because it is an enormous drain on your department? Because there were questions here that were asked you know, what are you going to need in the future with some of these big projects? Uh, it, it's a drain on your people. And for these projects that uh, you have to go back two, three, six times to inspect, it, it is putting a drain on, on you, the number of inspections that you do yearly. So um, are, are you able to either put a halt on certain contractors doing work in our town or up front knowing that they're going to be doing that type of work that's going to put drains on you. You can um, maybe add some, uh, I, I think on a lot of residential projects, there's like a $200 bond that people put in in case there's a, a reinspection, and then they might not get all that money back. But are, are there things that you can do up front to either um, look at these contractors that seem to have a, a reputation um, I guess I'd like your thoughts there. Yeah, and um, probably needs a whole other separate report, honestly. But um, we we have talked about it as a department. Um, <coughs> uh, talked about one end of the spectrum to the other, um, from you know massive amounts of testing and all kinds of stuff which would be very resource intensive to manage um you know it's not just simply proctoring a test it's having all the written rules i've i i have some um written rules unfortunately illinois is a a uh, very weak state in regards to contractor licensing registration uh, relatively to many other states. Um, I've, got a, I've got a book on my desk actually from uh, the state of Florida for becoming a registered electrical contractor and the thing's probably about 80, 90 pages thick just on administrative rules for what you got to do and, and, and how to become a, an electrical contractor in the state of Florida. So. Um, if you're going to do it, you got to do it right. Otherwise you have sort of all these, uh, rules that are difficult to enforce on them and you're getting all kinds of, uh, you know, it require a lot of legal assistance as well. Um, you start telling people they can't work in town. Um, my experience has been if, 
if they have the resources and the means, they're not just going to sit back and say, okay, I won't work in your town. If there's money to be made and building new houses or whatever the case, they're going to have attorneys saying, hey, you can't kick me out of your town just because I failed an inspection four times. That's what you're here for. Charge me. So there's difficulties from that perspective and trying to to do that involves you know a, a, a deep look um, so yeah and and I and I don't have a full uh, analysis for you on this but my experience has been it's not easy to do high level quality control on contractors at a local level Tr Tr trustee Schumbach just that you know I think it's something we certainly can talk about more but I mean literally this afternoon Steve and I had almost this exa exact same conversation um, be because it's and it's one of those things that if you don't really do it well and do it very thoroughly which we just don't have the resources to do then you have to question the value of doing it hardly at all because unless you're there checking every single worker on a job site and you know it's you know they you can you know them having an acme you know carpentry t-shirt doesn't mean that they're licensed they could be anybody and um, so it, it's a it's a very difficult issue especially in this environment when tradespeople are so in demand and the the rates are, are going up because you know anyone is can can do it they're very the marketplace is really incentivized people cutting corners in these issues and, and so it's it's not there's no simple answer to that question well and then just to elaborate on that a little bit too say we did have these strict requirements guess what cost of construction is going up in town too because you're only going to have a limited supply of contractors who are going to be able to pass the test and be able to work in town and their prices are naturally going to go up and you know that you have to look at the, the economic consumer. impact on all this as well mm -hmm. thank you trustee baldino thank you mayor um steve you you were talking earlier about uh, what you call elimination of low value requirements. And I certainly understand the rationale. Um, eliminating the front counter interactions and gaining efficiencies. Um, but the, the permitting process is about quality and safety of construction here in town. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, when you were talking about this, you said that the contractors are licensed by the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. And we just heard you say that um, the licensing by the state of Illinois isn't the greatest. Right. Uh, so my question is, I understand for, you used the example of, uh, of re-roofing in the report and, and roofing here in the presentation. I understand that when the, the inspector goes out, there's only so much that they can see. Um, but there is an inspection. And the contractor has an expectation that somebody can come out and look at it. And while I'm not necessarily opposed to eliminating these things that take up resources that don't have a lot of benefit, if we take all the stops off, how do we ensure quality and safety for these types of, of projects? Sure. Well, I can... Um touch on that a little bit first of all the requirements in the code for doing roofing to code will still exist it will still be a code requirement in the village that a roof is done in a certain way that that doesn't go away just because we don't require a permit for it it just means you know we don't require a permit for it but they still got to build a roof to code so if for instance a resident called us and said hey I had a problem with my roofer we would still surely go out there and service that person, take a look at it, and help them deal with something that wasn't code compliant and could even write that contractor a citation if necessary to get them to comply with doing the code. So we, we would maintain quality in that way. Um, uh, but I, I guess the potential also exists that if we're not potentially looking at all of them that um, we might not see something that slips through the cracks typically with a roof if it's leaking usually a homeowner knows about it pretty soon and we're going to get a call and and something's going to happen so it it helps kind of regulate itself in, in some ways 
If I if I could uh, if I could trustee you Baldino, know, like you know the the roofing one is I, I think is a good example, and I think it's one of those things where certain aspects of our process bring add more value to a homeowner than others, and some of them may even give them a false sense of security, and that's what we're trying to avoid. We had an incident a um, year or two ago um, with a resident who, uh, you know, the roofer did not do good work. And it, a lot of it was kind of hidden stuff internally. And they really kind of came after the village saying, you know, I got an inspection. What did I pay my permit for? What am I paying my taxes for? You guys didn't inspect this. And if we inspected every roof permit to the level of detail that would have been required for this person to catch it, I mean, we wouldn't have very much time to do anything else. But at the same time, this person still, they're, they're still for these situations, there's an expectation that the person does it to code. And if it's caught, you can still go back to them and say, you were supposed to build this to code. You're a licensed contractor. We can go to the state, say you could potentially lose your, your license. So we're going to have to look at that very carefully. And it's not something we do willy-nilly, but as part of our assessment, I mean, we, we, we do want to kind of look at where are we really adding value to our, our homeowners, our taxpayers, and where are we not? And um, and I think that just has yeah. to be part of the equation. Sure, and I understand that. And I me didn't yeah. mean to pick on roofs. Oh, I'm oh. sure no, no, that sure. Good you know there's 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 other areas that that you're going to t be talking. Yeah, about. yeah absolutely. Uh, and, and we just talked about the we talked a number of times tonight about the the quality of contractors that are coming in. And so uh, I, I I'm just concerned about taking all the stops off because you're sure. always going to have that risk of contractors cutting corner you had pictures of it here this evening uh you know it's always going to happen sure but if we have nothing going on no checks right uh, then you know the uh, i guess my it's, point is that the possibility of that occurring more often is is greater yeah okay we don't disagree and definitely part of something we have to analyze okay. for sure thank you mayor okay anybody else Seeing none. Thanks, Steve can, and Mark. Can I make one more comment before Steve? I, I just want to say I know Steve's presentation was a little bit longer. Um, that was because I asked him to. Um, when we went through this over the last couple of days, he had a shorter presentation. And I know these are issues that were, have been very important to the board over the last couple of years. And, and I, I didn't want to shortchange it. And, and in particular, you, you know, the building and life safety department is not something where you can fix with or improve with broad strokes. It is detailed work. And I really want to make sure that the board gets a flavor of that. There's a lot of good work being done. There's a lot of things that we're moving through the process. Steve and the people on his leadership team are very detail-oriented, conscientious people. And you really need to kind of get in there and, and see some of the things that, that he went through to understand the difficulty, but also the progress that's being made. And, and I just didn't want to shortchange that, so that's why it was a little bit longer. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Public Works, Scott. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Board of Trustees. I'm Scott Shirley, Director of Public Works. Got some key staff here tonight. Uh, Chris Paperniak, the Assistant Director of Public Works. Chester Gorecki is our Management Analyst and our Budget Coordinator. And then Mike Pagonis is the village engineer. Um, there's a lot of deeper dive in the written document, so I'm going to just go on a very kind of 50,000 foot level through the slides. There's there's a lot more detail in here regarding the um, uh, taking engineering under the Public Works Department this past year. And so, if you wanted anybody wants to get into more detail about that performance measures, we're certainly willing to do that. Here, Scott, you're already at questions, so you're already yeah, ready. Yeah, good job. Huh? What? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not I know I'm not recycling. That was quick. It's more than 500,000 foot level. Right. <laughs> I thought you were done already. There you go. So again, Republic Works. This is the first picture we took with everybody, all hands on deck, including engineering. So we're pretty proud of that. Um, so we've got 10 operating units now with 101 full-time employees. The 10th unit is engineering. Uh, we're talk calling it a unit or a division, depending on how you look at it. Um, we operate and maintain the village's basic infrastructure, all the storm sewer, all the sanitary sewer, all the combined sewer, all the water systems, all the trees, traffic signals, street lights, detention basins, roads, um, 
you know, it's all under our umbrella. So um, pretty detailed. And now with engineering, we're designing what we're also building and maintaining. Um, we also maintain all the municipal buildings, the parking garages. Uh, there are three public parking lots, um, actually four with the municipal garage, water and sewer pumping stations, water storage tanks, and water wells. Uh, we use water, uh, well water for backup source. We do not use that as a primary source of water. All our water is Lake Michigan water and has been since 1984 and 1985. We maintain all the village vehicles and equipment, including police and fire apparatus and uh, the Wheeling Township buses. We don't park the buses inside over at Public Works anymore. We kind of stole those spaces back from them, um, but we still maintain them all, and those are subject to Department of Transportation safety inspections because they carry passengers. Um, the department has legal reporting and compliance responsibilities to numerous agencies, and it's, it's getting more voluminous. IEPA, MWRD, I, IDOT, who are local, IDOL is our OSHA, IDNR, Army Corps of Engineers, US EPA, and OSHA. Um, staff performs plan reviews for all public and private development and regulates the work of franchise utility provider owners within public rights of way of easements. So I was just talking today with some other public works directors and the work we do with NICOR, for example, with the downtown and the way we kind of intervene and try to help homeowners with issues with cable TV companies, uh, telephone companies, ComEd, NICOR restorations and whatnot is pretty unique to Arlington Heights. We spend a lot of time on that. A lot of communities just say, you're the customer of WOW, so go ahead and have at it. And we try to do a little bit more than that. We try to intercede a little bit and say, hey, WOW, come on. You know, and depending on the, the, uh, the safety issues, you know, ComEd and NICOR, a little bit higher level of safety. You're not going to get electrocuted by a telephone wire or a cable wire, but most people don't know which is which. So we're, at, we're there to go out, identify what it is, try to get them in touch with the pri proper utility and, and do a little bit of, like I said, intercession on the rehab. Um, so here are the 2018 accomplishments. We uh, completed the fourth year of our parking garage rehabilita rehabilitation program. So um, we should be good for 20 years. There will be some maintenance that has to be done periodically so we don't have to go through such a big capital expense in 20 years, but uh, we just completed that this year. Chris oversaw that program himself. Um, we initiated a comprehensive approach to pavement maintenance using a new p paveware software program. So we have IMS uh, in town and they are surveying all the streets this year. And uh, once we get that, we will be able to rate all the street sections and it's really done by block. So every street, uh, regardless of how long it is, is broken up into blocks because some streets were constructed, you know, North Ridge might be 1980 or early 1990s and the south part of Ridge, you know, in town here is, is goes way back. Um, we completed the design of two major stormwater control projects for 2019 construction. So you see what's going on down at Cypress. All the pipe is almost in, they're moving dirt. It's a pretty cool project actually. Um, engineers get excited about those kind of things because uh, you don't see a lot of earth moving projects around here. We're really built out. Uh, and then obviously the downtown sewer construction, um, they saw, saw cut the concrete starting Monday and they're going to start tearing out uh, pavement on Tuesday or Wednesday of next week, I believe. So they have started, Martam Construction has started the downtown sewer project. It, it's not real invasive yet, but it's going to get really really intense pretty quick. Um, we successfully merged the two functions of engineering department into public works. We completed a private and public brush cleanup after the November 25th, 26th snow and ice event. If everyone remembers, it wasn't that long ago that we had that really bad snow and ice storm, the heavy snow, and it knocked down everything, and a lot of people were without power for, for long periods of time. And uh, so if you look in some of the performance measures, you'll see the call volume, which is normally kind of even over the winter months in November of last year, there was quite a spike. Uh, it was the highest month in November because of that storm and because of the private brush pickup. Um, we continued, continued to advance and increase our public outreach and use of social media. So I can have these guys do a deeper dive if you want, but we're, trying, we're out there on Twitter. Um, we tweeted about the IMS piece of equipment that's out surveying the street so people didn't think it was a, a spaceship or something. And um, so we're getting all that and, and we're doing a lot of that. We're reaching out to uh, local school groups. We've got a lot of different programs. And so this is just one example of 
I think it's Tree University, run by our forestry in the picture, showing some kids uh, getting educated about trees and, and their value. Um, and then the completion of the new police station. Chris did that with the help of some of his foremen, but he really ran the whole show for us. And that was a big project, and it got complex. Which way? Okay, um, so we replaced almost a mile and a half of uh, aging water main last year. Um, we are working our way up to try to do about three miles per year. We're at the two million or two and a half million right now and the target that we presented in a water rate study uh, for the rates that end at the end of this year um, was to get up to something around 1% of our system. So we'd be up in the two and a half um, to three mile range per year. We're we're, we've been losing ground and we're trying to catch up. Um, we completed the data gathering phase of the MWRD sewer smoke testing program. So that was a new program MWRD came out with. It's basically to identify leaky sewers that, that are, have open joints and whatnot. We completed both the resurfacing and reconstruction programs on time and within budget. And then we, uh, Mr. Recklaus has been working with engineering to kind of get those bid openings and those projects more front loaded in the year because we think we'll get some better pricing and whatnot and so we're almost there resurfacing you folks awarded I think last week or the week before and reconstruction started probably about three to four weeks ago um, we installed the replacement generator at Nickel Knoll which is a water storage and pumping station we completed the backyard drainage improvement program which has become very popular um, and we completed three phases of our annual edge grinding so we're current anticipated challenges. We're continuing to address our aging infrastructure. Um, it's a big, it's big news all over the country. Um, everywhere you go, you know, people are realizing that we, we kind of sat on our hands for, you know, the last 50 years and we didn't really keep up with all the development that took place. Um, so all the, all the water wells are rehabilitated. We won't have to do that for about 20 years, maybe 25 years. And at that point, I'm hoping that we have a redundant pipeline. Um, through the Northwest Water Commission to Lake Michigan, and then we can let those go. We can just put them back to nature. Um, we're continuing to increase water main replacement, as I mentioned. Um, lead and copper is, is going to be big. Um, lead and copper um, compliance started, I think, around 1990, and uh, the Northwest Water Commission started treating with polyorthophosphate. Um, so there's a lot of people concerned about this because of what happened in Flint, Michigan, and I think everyone needs to understand that we do have somewhere north of 4,000 lead services in town. It's a, it's a bit of an estimate because you don't know every single house, but it's basically the center portion of town is more likely to have lead services. There's also some lead solder in certain period homes, but that's not as significant. So this polyorthophosphate lines all of our water systems, all the copper service lines, all the lead service lines, all the lines in people's homes, and we've never had a hit. So we feel we are very protected from lead, and it's, it's about $31.5 million to replace all those lead services, public and private side. And that's what the legislation looks like it's going to be. So we would like to not take any action yet because we're, we're, we think we're protected. But I think what's going to happen is they're just going to make everyone do it because it, it's a fail safe. You know, I mean, it's, it's still there. It's still there. Um, we're doing water tank painting, uh, doing Thomas tank this year, generator replacements, and we're continuing to retrofit our pump stations with variable frequency drives that should help our water main break issue a little bit. Um, we'll need to begin addressing replacement of aging meters. We replaced all the meters in town residential about 18, 19 years ago. The batteries have lasted. We were worried about that. But now we're going through a water audit, and we're trying to identify where we're losing water. And some of it is probably in under-registering meters. They're not, they're not as accurate as they, they could be. Some of them can be rebuilt. They don't have to all be replaced. Um, and then we had the addition of major stormwater control improvements, which kind of amped up our responsibilities as far as projects this year. It's been a really busy department, um, you know, starting about four weeks ago when the sun finally came out. Um, and then we're increasing funding for water main and road programs, and that'll continue to tax our staff. So um, we're still managing unfunded federal, state, and regional unfunded mandates. I mean, this was a big buzz 
topic unfunded mandates but you know what no one cares but we still want to point it out that you know as this legislation comes down and more regulations they do not normally have funding sources for our compliance and so we either have to roll that into current staffing and, and operations or we we may need some help in the future but um, they add up there's just a lot of little stuff a lot of MWRD reports that are required now on an annual basis maintenance programs things like that it just adds up um, IEPA is pushing some testing requirements to increase the lead service testing um, and the replacement program and then this uh, America's Water Infrastructure Act also has some possible communication ramifications where we just have to communicate the quality of our system and the testing that was done for water over the course of a year we do it once now they're looking at twice uh, a year uh, the engineering division is understaffed. Um, I continue to believe that. I want to get through one construction season and make a judgment with Mike and Chris's help. Um, so we're, we're kind of shucking and jiving right now, and we're moving through town, doing a lot of stuff. We're very, very busy. I'm not ready to say, you know, what we need, but I just think in general, generally speaking, we do believe that engineering is understaffed. We may be able to address that contractually. We do have some part-time labor there for plan review. It's worked very well when you get the right person. Um, and we have had the right person the last couple of years. That person's helping out with inspections. So, um, so we're addressing it as best we can, but we may want to fine tune things as we go forward. Um, so one of the challenges is just the engineering inspector is just swamped during this time of year. And then with the backyard drainage program, with all this rain, you know, that just spikes for, as Steve was talking about, just for a month or two. And hopefully things will dry out. But, um, you know, it all, it all kind of hits at once. Um, so we continue to be challenged also with the ADA. So all of the downtown paver brick project that's coming up and whatnot, the ADA when it came out, and I want to say 88, 89, um, which is America's with Disabilities Act, um, it allowed some, um, what do I want to say, there was some ambiguity to it. You could take exceptions if they were financially challenging. So if you had to correct the, the slope on a corner and you had to create a retaining wall for the lawn, you know, to get that slope, you could say that's an exception and we don't do it. And now, as you've seen the last few years, we're putting in these small retaining walls on residential lots to get the corners. They just have tightened up things with these new requirements, and, they, and they're not really accepting you don't have the money to do it or, you know, it's, it's too much. It's on private property. They're just like, you know what, you need to fix it. They're disabled, need these, these features. These slopes are very critical to operations. And, and there's just a lot of disabled people in town, especially here. Um, that use our, you know, our pavement and our pedestrian ways. Um, and then we're um, working with uh, Village Hall as necessary. They're putting in, uh, we're going to be selecting a new e enterprise resource planning software program, which basically is all the accounting and purchasing, um, all the timekeeping and payroll. Um, we've got a, a system in town now that's like DAS. Uh, if you guys remember DOS, it was right after Fortran, I think, and there was a couple others in there that went the way of the dinosaur, but, um, but we're, we're attacking that this year. Um, so potential new initiatives, I and mean, we're continuing to public outreach to residents and businesses. Um, you know, I've got, a, I've got a great staff of young people that come up with just great ideas, and, and I, I'm, it's better when I stay out of their way. So I, I trust them, and we, we seem to hit things pretty good compared to our competitors, our, our public works peers in other towns, and, and we try to do a good job compared to other departments within the village as well. Um, we're streamlining our new utility locates. We do 14,000 utility locates a year. It's crazy. Um, so we have to locate sewer. We have to locate water. We have to locate streetlight, electric, um, and a few other miscellaneous. So um, we've got a software program that's going to um, automatically feed all those to the uh, tablet and a car for the guy that can do them. Um, we're trying out the trenchless water main rehabilitation down in the Cypress area. We're going to main or we're lining water main down there. Um, that's about two million of the eight million down there is the water main. Oh, I'm sorry. The water main replacement money is being used for water main lining this year because they're in the backyards. We've purchased some new traffic counting equipment. We have almost the whole backlog of traffic counts uh, caught up 
Uh, there was a backlog of about 40 or 50 requests for information that the traffic engineer then uses to decide whether or not a speed uh, change is necessary or a stop sign is warranted. Um, and then we're just, we're just trying to continue fostering professional development. Uh, I think engineering, for whatever reason, um, you know, there are educated folks with engineering degrees, a little bit, you know, like more like our front office over at the original Public Works. Um, so they need a different level of uh, training and professional development. And so I'm trying to challenge those folks to look at master's degrees, look at management certificates, you know, challenging them to, hey, what do you want to be next? What do you want to be when you grow up? You want to be the village engineer? You want to be public works director? You want to be assistant director of public works? You know, let's, I want to see those people get challenged a little bit. And, um, and so I probably will be asking for a little bit more money. I don't know if it'll make it to you guys or not, if this gentleman allows it through, but I think engineering's budget on education and training was lower than it should be. So, so that's, I think that's all I got. Yeah, I don't have a question slide. So all right. with that, we'll take quest questions. All right, thanks, Scott. Well, the Public Works Department certainly has done a lot of shucking and jiving as you said, <laughs> uh, over the past year. That's one of my favorite, yeah. As a result of the challenging <laughs> winter that we had. So kudos to uh, all of those in the Public Works Department for all the great work uh, over the course of the last year. We continue to hear just great things about all members of the Public Works Department and the quality and uh, nature of the service that they provide. And so uh, we just appreciate your can-do attitude uh, on a daily basis. And so thank you for that. You're welcome. I just had one question yeah. on the top 10 requests received in 2018. I think I understand water bill high investigation, but who would complain about a water bill that was too low? Well, well. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> Actually, those are generated by the radio read system. So, you know, we radio read all the water meters in town, and so we've got a part-time guy who drives through town, and there's equipment that reads the radios. If there's an extreme variance month to month, or if there's, you know, it just looks at variations in the numbers and trends from previous years for particular properties, and it, it'll send us a flag for a high read way more often than a low read. Um, no, but this is, these are not generated generally by, by residents or, or businesses, residents. Okay. but there are some. Some feel that when, when some of those rate increases went into effect, I think we had one the first year, it might have been 10 or 12 percent. You know, we jacked it up at first and then we kind of leveled off. There were people that called right away because they noticed a higher bill and didn't really realize, you know, they didn't, they didn't, these just don't, people just don't read stuff, you know, and so they didn't know that we were going to have increases that were that dramatic. Um, so that's that's some of it too. So yeah, no one ever calls in Mayor Hayes for a low okay. water bill. Yeah, that doesn't happen. Trusty Canty. Uh, I just had two questions because mm -hmm. you always answer my questions on the fly. Um, the the sidewalk that you were talking about, making them accessible and compliant with the ADA. I was just curious if there are grants or things that we can look for to help offset some of those costs. You know what, I'll ask Mike Pagonas to answer, but I believe there is some money. It's not, uh, it's not dramatic, it's not, it's not a lot, but Mike, do you? I may be mistaken, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I don't know of anything specific. I know we, we try to look for as many different grants and, and uh, sources of income as, as possible uh, will continue to do that and if there are we will definitely pursue them yeah. and then my my second question was Same. related to your software product target solutions so we heard a lot about the ERP from you and from yeah, everybody yeah. but it sounds like you've already got something in the works and so I'm curious as to how those will, yeah, will you know, play together. Well Target Solutions, that's a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer Either. except to explain Target Solutions is something different. Okay. Um, yeah, Target Solutions is kind of a way to track training and um, certain other activities you know within. So we're using, HR is using it, um, mm -hmm. Public Works and Fire started with it and HR really liked it and so now they're doing it. Um, but it won't really compete with a full-blown ERP system. This is really more a, a user interface for um, people keeping track of their training, keeping track of, like, manuals and things like pieces of information that they need. I don't know if anyone else wants yeah. to elaborate. Yeah, on. and just the one thing we like about it in Public Works is we can send emails now to each 
employee in public works and say, you have this training this day. And so it's just a, a better way of communicating with our staff. I think fire's doing the same thing because yes. they have to track all their training to meet certain grant or, or other requirements. So it's, it's not, you know, remember the ERP has to be protected because of all the right. personal data and all the financial stuff in there. So it's a, it's a much different system. That's like the mothership with the ERP. Right. This is just a kind of an in-house. And we actually got this from Irma, from um, our insurance carrier. Okay. We got, we got the recommendation for Target and Fire and PW. We liked it right away. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Trustee Rosenberg. Thank you, Scott. Um, thank you, Mayor. So the Pazolanic pavement that we still have, do we know how much is still left in the streets? Any idea, Mike? A lot. I'm going to call Mike up. <laughs> <laughs> For those that don't know, the Pazolanic pavement base was a, I guess, poorly constructed uh, base that was used in the streets years and years ago and has greatly deteriorated, deteriorated the streets uh, way ahead of what was supposed to be uh, a long-lasting pavement base. Yeah, it was touted as, you know, back in the Roman times they used it and look how long it lasted, but it required certain ideal conditions that mm -hmm. in the real world it just didn't didn't work out. And so a lot of the pavements in the 70s and early 80s that were done here in the Paz um, are showing their age. And uh, there were probably 70 miles back when I started and we're probably you know down to 50 or 40 at this point we can get a lot better um, read after, especially after we uh, get a report back from IMS we'll have some more detailed numbers so but we're definitely chipping away at all these reconstruction streets most of those are our past streets that we're pulling up and, and putting full depth asphalt down so when we only do a couple miles a year, it doesn't uh, go right, very yeah, far. So. It's a uh, chip away at it. And, uh, you know, looking back, we've done quite a few, quite a bit. I mean, Northgate is almost completely done. Uh, there's many subdivisions that are almost completely re redone. And, uh, you know, over the course of 30 years, it's we've done quite a bit. <laughs> so this new pavement, the IMS system that we're putting into play, we'll, Will there be any effect of anything being done in 19 as a result of that still? I mean, because there's still many streets out there I see that are greatly deteriorated, and I'm not sure they're really on the list. Uh, and speaking of list, uh, I don't think we ever got a list this year of streets that were, did we? Oh. We put out, um, I want to say the last Friday packet, we did put out the map that has all of the... Uh, Right, but usually we projects. get a listing with streets of what's rehabbed and what's not. We, we can get that to you, get you right yeah. away. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so will that? So, so I'm not sure which if those streets are actually on that list or not. But uh, uh, and I don't know what's going to be done with edge grinding and on some of the streets. Uh, I don't know if there's a list of those identified. Yes. Mm -hmm. so maybe we can get those because it seems like we still have a lot of streets that are greatly deteriorated. Um, so the 1% of water mains that we're supposed to replace a year, will that actually get us <laughs> since we need about another 100 years for that? Um, well, it, it's just getting us to the break even. And so because we're kind of lagging, um, well, I, I think the best approach that I think would, would be just to let's get there. Let's see how it is to manage that much water main replacement per year. It's double what we're doing now. Um, and see if we see if we can break off that water main break frequency curve a little bit. You know, if we can see a little bit of benefit from what we're doing. Um, otherwise, you know, we may have to look at, we'll, have, we'll see how the lining goes. You know, that may be a preferable um, in some cases, depending on the size of the main. Um, so to answer your question, I think we're, targeted for one percent we're going to revisit water and sewer rates i think sometime late summer early fall because the current rate structure expires at the end of december 2019 and um, between the meter issue and the water main issue we'll have to see where we are trustee rosenberg so i i you know i i don't know that we'll be talking about something as dramatic as the last five-year plan did you know how it kind of jacked up things initially 
a little bit higher, but um, certainly some increase I think is warranted just because of the system and, and how much work it's taken to, you know, take care of the, its age, just trying to replace it. If, if I could, Trustee okay. Rosenberg, too, you know, in the finance report, there was a nice breakdown, I'm trying to pull it up now, of the number of water main breaks we have compared to other communities. And oh, it's, yeah, yeah, significantly higher. It's sig yeah. Yeah, if you look at, you know, we had 250. Um, that was our average per year for the last um, five years. I mean, other communities, 30, 45, 60, 27. Um, in, in the one, Tom, Tom Keeney and I and, and Scott and Chris, we've been talking about this stuff a lot. And, you know, if you think this, a water main's going to last 100 years, if all of our water mains were average of 50 years, so right where they should be, then we should be replacing 1% a year. When our average age is 65, we need to be doing a heck of a lot more than 1% a year if we really want to keep up. And we can take a chance that some of it lasts longer and some of it will. But again, I mean, one of the things we're finding, kind of like the Pazlonic base, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I mean, the some of the stuff that went in in the 60s is of poorer quality than the stuff that went in the 40s or the 30s. And that, and that causes us a problem now just because we've spent money now. We've had to spend money recently replacing pipe that was only 40 and 50 years old that never made it design life of the 100 years. So we've already spent some of that money just based on, on brake frequency and the poor pipe made at the time. Bad alloys. Yeah. So the lead service lines, if we are forced to replace those by the state, um, will we be obligated to pay for 100% of the cost up to the house, uh, outside the house? What, how, how will that well, Right work? now the code says that we're responsible for the service line from the main, and we're responsible from the main, obviously, to the buffalo box. And then we also own and maintain the buffalo box, which is the outside shutoff valve. And then the homeowner or property owner is, owns and is responsible for the service line from the buffalo box to the home or the, or the building. So if you go directly on our code, which is not uncommon for municipalities to have that split there, um, you know, we would not be on the hook for the, the second half of service lines. I think what IEPA, though, is looking at is then how do you compel private property owners who have funding issues and other challenges, you know, to get those all replaced. Because I think their goal is just get them all out, get them all out. It, it, and so, yeah. go ahead, Randy. I, no, I was going to say, this is something we've been talking to our legislators with close. The last time I was in Springfield, we had a long conversation about it. And I think one of the, especially for folks that may be watching at home, one of the points that I think is really important to make, because people will talk about the Flint, Michigan experience, which was terrible, is the problem in Flint, Michigan wasn't just merely that they had lead water pipes it's that they were not engaging in treatment to deal with those pipes right. and i think that's a big difference there there are many lead pipes across the country and they have not seen those those issues because they um, because we have doing what we've been doing in terms of all the best practices in the industry of coating them with the phosphate treatment and um and so i think that's a that's an important thing for our our residents i think to understand at home is that we're engaging in all the best practices in the industry, in the water industry, to keep our system safe. Now, the state obviously has the ability to raise standards, and that's something that they're looking at. And I think that, um, you know, as, as costly as this would be for us, you know, we're a community that actually has a pretty good handle on our system and has a fair amount of means. Um, when you look downstate and you look at other parts of the state, you know, you say that you'd have to uh, eat at something close to a proportional $31 million. You know, they don't have any place where they would be able to find that money. And I think that message is being received in Springfield. And so while the, a bill is kind of surfacing and then going below the surface back and forth, um, you know, there hasn't been, there's a lot of hesitancy on a lot of folks on this issue because of the fact that, you know, the best practice treatment is something that is really being a focus, but also that a funding source just really hasn't been identified. And I think it's prudent for us to keep this in mind and plan for it and have in the back of our head and have an idea of what it would involve. But, you know, we don't believe at this point it's something that um, is imminent um, as, as an issue 
uh, and as you all know, we have a lot of other um, pressing infrastructure needs that are clearly or something that we have to deal with and um, that, you know, we still are, are looking to find funding for. Is, is that $31 million just the village's share, basically from the Buffalo box to the street, or do we recall? Yeah, I think it is just our share. Okay. Usually we're about two-thirds of the line, percentage-wise. Yeah. Generally, the Buffalo box is closer to the home than it is to the water main. Um, so the resident property owner's side is usually shorter. Um, but, yeah, that is just what would be our responsibility under our current code. But I, IEPA can change that. Yeah. And just a, a thank you to everybody in public works and engineering for all their, the way they uh, act, interact with the residents. And, you know, we constantly get comments about how positive they are and how friendly they are and how responsive they are and, you know, as far as in, even engineering with the streets and everything that's going on. And public works guys are just great for that. So pass that on. Thanks. I will. Thank you. Trustee Baldino. Thank you, Mayor. Um, sort of piggybacking on what, what Trustee Rosenberg was talking about. I, I was thinking about the water main breaks. Um, and we just talked about how we have 250 breaks on average uh, over the last five years per year. Um, when we have a water main break, um, is that a pipe replacement or is it, is it, is it a patch? It depends. If it's okay. bad, we have to cut out a section, which means we have to turn off the water and you'll see a boil order right. normally in this situation. If we can, if it's just a, a blowhole, as we call them, um, then we'll put a sleeve on it. So that's a patch. Okay. Yep. So uh, my ultimate question is, is that being factored in into the... 8,500 feet per year that we're replacing. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The the worst breaks um, are you know are kind of um, tallied up a little higher. Um, the guys know what's out there and they know where our target spots are, and so we're we're hitting the highest frequency mains. Um, but you know once you strengthen one segment of main, then the weakest link. Is what goes next you know so you're, you're 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 kind of moving things around sometimes uh in the end it'll be good but sometimes you could be chasing you could be chasing ghosts to some degree i think that getting the vfds in our pump stations is really critical and um you know we uh we now pump and our pumps you know they they basically go on full pump one and it it, it, it spikes it spikes yeah. you get water hammer yep. um and so the vfds just spool up to speed slowly to the point where they get to that rpm to deliver the requested amount or the required amount and then if a second one is needed it spools up slowly and then you spool down because the other half of it is you turn them off and then you get, you get the inverse of the spike you know you get cavitation or you get right. you know you just get problems so um we can do ourselves some good by going through those upgrades to our pumping stations and we're doing that now and then the other thing, I don't want to, I don't want to hit this too hard, but the other issue with the the Flint, Michigan issue, was a change in water source. Okay, it wasn't just a treatment issue. It was a treatment issue, but it was a treatment issue predicated on a change of water source. We're not going to have that issue here. So uh, uh, just to allay anybody's fears about potential lead and copper exposure here, that that's not a potential impact here. Um, also, thank you to the entire Public Works Department for everything they do. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Labeds. Thank you. Um, thank you, Scott, for uh, all you do, all your staff does. And um, as uh, Trustee Rosenberg said, um, we get so many positive comments about how wonderful everyone is to work with. And uh, you really represent the village it's, you know, so well. So we thank you for that. Um, my, my question is about the edge grinding process. Mm -hmm. So um, if I, as I understand it, you, you know, you go down the side of the street uh, to the curb, grind it up, and then when you get ready to patch over the, a portion of it with fresh asphalt, correct? Yes. So I have had a few comments where one side of the street's done and nothing happens on the other side of the street and people 
say to me, that looks kind of weird. And I do tell them that this process is meant to prolong the life of the road so that we don't have to do major repavement and we'll save some money and, and so on and so forth. But um, is there anything more we could say, I could say um, to them? Well, I've seen some occasions where we run to the end of a phase or at the end of a year and we do one half of the street and then we get there the, the next year. But if we only do one half and we don't come back and do the other outside, you mm -hmm. know, half uh, the next year, I'm going to believe that the guys have analyzed the streets and one side was worse than the other. And if they're going off that street somewhere else, there's somewhere else that they've rated worse. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, it's a little bit of this, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, it's not, it's not a real exact science, but you know, it's, um, you know, those are locations where the center of the pavement and maybe in the locations you're talking about, maybe one whole two thirds of the pavement is okay, but you've got drainage problems. And generally that's what drives these edge grind issues is drainage problems with broken curb or broken up asphalt. And then, you know, it gets in the sub base, it freezes and thaws. So, uh, um, so I'm times. thinking so, yeah. like around um, Vale near the library, for example, in, mm -hmm. in Fremont. Um, so it's possible that, you know, this could be a two-year process. Is that it, what you're it saying? It could, and it could be one half just this, this year and the other half five years from now. Okay. It just depends on where that half, you know, kind of falls within the range of everything else. Sometimes we do some things just because of proximity. So I'm, I think they're borderline. They'll do both sides. Okay. But I'm going to presume in this case it was something that was – enough identifiable that they you know they only did one half okay Mike right. had something that you want yeah to sure if if you look at uh, a lot of those locations I think what you'll find or what most people find uh, one side is a lot of residential driveways and everything on the other side maybe a park or something like that mm. um, that doesn't get the uh, garbage trucks stopping and starting every time and and, and okay. we do find that on those types of streets where there's an open you know park or something on one side and residential on the other that residential side gets torn up more than the park side and there that's those are some of the streets where half has ah, been done they are yeah you're right so that's that's good information yeah, to yeah, know thanks, thank you thank you that's all i have okay trustee Tanaya. just real briefly i'll take 30 seconds scott you and your crew are a well-oiled machine i mean really uh, the guys in the trucks all winter long doing what they do. It's it's awesome. It's awesome. 101 guys? Well, 101 with engineering now. Yeah. So when I started, we had 107 in Public Works alone. And then in 2008 and 2012 were some cuts that brought us down, I think, 92 with yeah. Public Works. And then we added back in another nine bodies yeah. um, with engineering. And like the police and fire, I mean, you're that's about how big those crews are right i think one's bigger than i think one's about the same but and the other poli police is about 20 people bigger but you're about the same size as fire yeah. Yeah. awesome awesome job i mean thanks i i think uh <laughs> it was already said the comments that we get back i w often wonder if you like pay those people to write those things but <laughs> <laughs> like i know that randy has got all of you guys talking about this erp thing every, every single one of you guys <laughs> brought it up so can't say i cannot confirm or deny whether cannot or not confirm I or deny, but if Crudy. it doesn't come out of charles's mouth tomorrow or thursday next week whatever i'll be surprised all right thanks yeah. again guys you're welcome and you know what the crp though it's been a long time coming i mean i have i don't think i put them in here but we've got a summary of the issues we've had regarding payroll and purchasing where this old system just doesn't do things the way we do things now you know, and it's time. We've gotten our money's worth, believe me. Sure. They've all been talking to me about it for the last couple of years. Too. Sure. <laughs> but, yeah. I, think that, I, think um, I just want to say on behalf of all the residents of Arlington Heights, thank you to the Public Works Department for, gosh, all the stuff you do. I'm, you know, those water main breaks often happen in the middle of winter on a Sunday night at 2 a.m., and you guys, you guys have been out there. I've had five of them in front of my house over the years, and they were always out there real quick getting it done and, and making the interruption as small as possible. And um, the forestry department, uh, they cut uh, down something like 13,000 ash trees from the emerald ash borer. Yes, but sir. then they were really smart in saving that wood so it could be used in our new police station. 
Um, so those trees weren't totally lost to our town. And um, just all the, the, just the basic services of keeping our streets up and, and plowing like they did during that big storm at the end of November, um, those guys were out there all the time and they came back and forth on our street, on my street in particular, kept it open and we could get out and we can't appreciate that enough. So thank you, really, thank you so much for what you guys do. Yeah, thank you very much. And I just wanna say Chris and uh, Drew, were the engineers of the ash wood reuse I said no and I told them not don't spend a penny and they went ahead and did it and then it then when I got this award I used it as one of my accomplishments <laughs> <laughs> so, so it goes. and by the way Who managed <laughs> congratulations on your APA yeah, yes thank you. congratulations thank you. it's really fun and go back to DOS <laughs> <laughs> all right is there anything further from the board all right seeing none thanks Scott thank and you. team mm -hmm. And is there anything further for the good of the order? No, just one more thing about Public Works. I just want to acknowledge that, you know, when we talked about merging um, engineering and Public Works, there was definitely some apprehension whenever you, you engage in something like that. People on both sides were worried and thinking about the worst case scenario. And I, I want to say that, number one, Scott and Chris and Mike have done a really good job of kind of integrating everybody, making everyone feel valued, but at the same time, they're already starting to optimize some of these processes and we're everywhere work together and we're already seeing some of the fruits of it. So I just want to give them credit because that's not an easy thing to do and they've done it very well. So right. Thanks, Randy. Is there any other business? I remind everybody at the Memorial Library. Well, yeah, uh, we are hoping to have good weather for this weekend and we've got some thunderstorms predicted, but we certainly, um, want to remind everyone that this is the 100th anniversary of our Memorial Day Parade and Ceremony. The parade kicks off at 9.30, uh, Lord willing, at Monday morning, and the ceremony is at 11 o'clock at Memorial Park. So we hope to see everyone out on a good morning. So, Trustee Padovani. And if I could add to that, Mayor, um, we're having professional meteorologists actually help us predict the weather for Arlington Heights specifically um, and they're asking us to keep an eye, I'm asking them to keep an eye, and they're giving me updates literally every day. Um, and so far for Monday, they are talking about a clear area, um, a clear time on Monday morning with the storms coming in in the afternoon. Well, we'll take that. But then they also say that could change. So I'd ask everybody to it watch your email, here. watch your social media, just watch the announcements. We'll... Um, let everybody know uh, if the parade is canceled uh, no later than uh, Saturday. And even if it is, um, I want everybody to know the ceremony, which is the real purpose of Memorial Day, which is to honor and remember our fallen heroes, that ceremony will still take place at 11 o'clock. It'll just be moved inside to the Christian Liberty Academy which is the old Arlington High School. They have a very nice, great, the Grace Gym there, they do a very nice job of setting that up for us. And we did have it there once before. So if we do end up having to cancel the parade, which we all pray we won't, um, the ceremony will continue. Okay, thank you. All right, if no other business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Trustee Canty, seconded by Trustee Baldino. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you all for joining us tonight.